appointed hour. Um, we're going to start with liaison reports. John. Uh, thank you, Mr. Halsey. Uh, it's been a busy week for me uh, and all of us. Um, Thursday on the 2nd of March, uh, I was surprised to see three of my colleagues at the Human Relations Advisory Committee at the police station. I had uh, made a mad dash back from New York uh, and made the meeting with a few seconds to spare. But um, the takeaway from that, and I'll let you guys get your, obviously have your own thoughts, was that there's still ongoing discussions as to what the group uh, views as its responsibilities and how it would like to operate under. It has some opinions. Um, most interestingly, Wakefield's Human Relations Advisory Committee attended this meeting, um, I guess on behalf, uh, by invitation of um, Redding's HRAC, yep. and um, presented uh, their own structure and how they operate in the town of Wakefield, which is very different. They function via, um, under both the schools and the town, such that they are given issues to consider by the town manager commonly or the su superintendent. They, they form an opinion and they respond back to that town manager with a course of action. But it's, they've also got, most importantly, got a written policy that details this. And I, I'm guessing that the Reading HRAC might see some merit in at least considering that policy as a start point for their own consideration. Um, Friday, I met with Mr. Eric Burkhart, who uh, in tonight's packet you'll see a letter penned by Eric to us following our Tuesday meeting two weeks ago. And Eric and I sat down and I, and I he had some heartfelt comments and I went, I went and kind of recited where I thought my head was at and where the board's head was at. And um, I think he was very cordial after the meeting and I got a very um, uh, polite email after um, our coffee at Starbucks. On Saturday, like uh, uh, town manager uh, Kevin and Barry, I helped uh, together with the library trustees and staff welcome Congressman Seth Moulton to Reading for his town hall. It was really interesting. And I, I, I wish we had more of that because the, um, the big draw there was most of the attendees by my eyeballs were not from Reading. Just a quick show of hands and it wasn't, it wasn't less than 50%. It might have been 50%, but it was just amazing how many folks are not from Reading. Um, and then last night, together with uh, Mr. Berman, sat down with Caitlin Mercurio and Gina McCormick and began a, a discussion on the request for a resolution. Um, and that was just, I thought, very cathartic. There was a lot of good conversation. Um, a set of minutes was produced. Uh, Bob, is there a place where we would post the minutes on the web? I mean, I don't know what our policy Formal groups have a place to post minutes, but I'm not sure how this one will go. And yeah, I would really go with the Was selectmen's. this a posted meeting? Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah so it's <coughs> got to have minutes. Yeah, it'd be in the selectmen's area. Yeah. Whether we carve out something, I don't know. Can you help there, Paul? I, I believe Laura has set up something in the selectmen. Because it's really a subcommittee. Okay. It's a subgroup okay. of All right. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that's what it's going to call. I also made a, um, an audio of the entire meeting, um, which actually came up pretty good. The room is great. It's very quiet. Um, and you can hear everyone. It's a little annoying because while I'm typing, it sounds like a 1960s news program with a teletype <laughs> waiting in the background. But um, it's just a good way to document the, the conversation. Um, and we have a follow-up meeting scheduled for Thursday night at 7.30, this time in the room adjacent to this, the uh, conference room. Uh -huh. So that'll be this week, Thursday? That would be this week. We're trying to get a couple in here. Um, Barry's got some travel ahead of him for next week. I, I canceled the conference call for Thursday night, and um, we'll find a way to get it done. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Kevin. Um, yeah, I'll just emphasize the two things, obviously. Um, John mentioned the, the two areas that we were at over the, the last week. Um, the Human Relations Advisory Committee, I thought we had a um, very um, good and lively discussion um, at that meeting. And, you know, from it, as um, John had mentioned, looking at Wakefield as a potential model moving forward, not necessarily adopting um, word for word, but certainly looking at it from the standpoint of, um, of something that is a great starting point. 
the, I think the biggest difference now between, so if people are familiar, the Human Relations Advisory Committee right now is an advisory committee to the Board of Selectmen um, only. The way that's set up in um, Wakefield, they have a little bit more buy-in. So they also have not only the Board of Selectmen, but the school committee as a joint committee um, for the Human Relations Advisory Commission that they have down there. I think, Bob, the question that we have moving forward, obviously, is is that something under our bylaws that we're allowed to do? Obviously, Wakefield must be. Um, but that's something certainly of a question of ours. It's not something if we if we can't. It's not something we can't work around. But that's kind of step one where we wanted to see um, and, and get the opinion maybe from either you or town council. Can those two bodies actually have a joint committee? Um, would it be the first thing? And then look at the structure that the Wakefield Human um, um, Human Rights excuse me Human Rights Commission uh, is what they're called. Um, look at the structure and the way they formatted themselves and you know maybe pull from that and, and you know kind of adopt it to make it our own uh, would be kind of the next steps but I thought it was a good meeting I thought leaving there uh, I thought everybody had a little bit better understanding um, both between the Human Relations Advisory Committee and this board you know what what I think the objective is moving forward and what's the best thing uh, to do moving forward so I thought that was a good meeting um, and then it, it, you know it's always it's a it's always a pleasure to have our uh, legislation come back here from Washington to you know address the town leadership as well as address the citizens it would it probably would have been nice maybe next time we can we can have a reading only room if we're gonna <laughs> hold it in reading <laughs> uh, I hate to say that out of town but sorry we're gonna put you in the next room in the satellite division where I think most of the reading folks Boy, ended it was, up it was really oversubscribed yeah uh, it was and you know I have a feeling we had them if, if we went into the other rooms where they, they you know just for to give you a Quick setup at the library. They had the main room, which holds about 150, I believe. Yeah. Um, right? No, there was, there was it, it holds what the fire chief said could hold that day. Yeah. <laughs> it was only 150 in the room, regardless of how many were in the room. Exactly. Um, <laughs> but they, they had some overflow rooms th set up throughout the library with a three second delay, big screen um, for j so you could see what was going on and what. Um, Congressman Moulton was being asked what how he was what he was saying when he was addressing the crowd But it'd be interesting to go into those rooms because we did the one in the main room and Bob asked how many folks are here from um, Out of town and probably half if not maybe a little bit more, you know, did the hand raise I bet if we went to the other rooms It probably would have been less and I saw a lot of people coming out of those rooms that were Reading residents more than I saw coming out of the main room So just as a note maybe next time I guess bigger venue, but make sure we have a Reading a Reading room in front of the congressman if he's gonna Come here again would be good. Uh, I'm sure those residents would appreciate it. Uh, that's all I have. Okay. Very. Um, I attended a meeting of the um, trust fund commissioners, um, and most of us know the work of the trust fund commissioners through the work um, that they do with the, on the hospital trust fund and the cemetery trust fund, two really large funds that they manage. But they also manage a large number of very small trusts set up by families years and years ago, and. Um, which make donations uh, or scholarships. Uh, and so at this meeting, we went through, probably made about a, uh, uh, we didn't actually make the, the scholarships, but at least gave, you know, sort of set the money aside that um, for graduating seniors, scholarships will be given out in, uh, in May. So there's a, a large number of those family funds that, that, that we manage. Um, and then we also said goodbye to our, our town treasurer, who's yeah. been on that um, committee for a really long time. And so um, it was you know, just been yeoman's work on that. Um, I was the only selectman not at the Human Relations Advisory Committee. I was in Hamilton at my son's play. Um, and, and so I, I missed that, and, but did hear from, from folks. And I do want to kind of uh, talk a little bit about sort of the meeting we had last night, the subcommittee on the, um, on the resolution that was um, presented by some proponents here. I think we really made some, some good strides. And, um, I think that although that um, resolution was not proposed by the Human Relations Advisory Committee, um, I think it really relates to the work I think that they're doing and the work that um, we need to do in figuring out what the next steps are for HRAC, um, whether it's a commission with a big C, commission with a little C, um, the fact that that resolution that came before us a couple of weeks ago um, was sort of an ad hoc kind of gathering of, of people really concerned on issues, went to HRAC, um, sort of thinking that's the place to kind of talk about issues of, um, of, of inclusion and, and um, uh, things like that. Um, you know, it's not sort of a formal proposal from them, 
Um, and, and, and so, but I think the, two, the, the work of the two are really related in that the fact that, you know, a group of 50 people came here one night with hundreds of signatures, um, it really dovetails into the work. So I think, you know, we as a board really need to, you know, sort of pay attention to this and really um, get on the right footing with Human Relations Advisory and, and sort of give them their path um, and, 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 you know, help them sort of figure out what they're going to do and what their relationship is going to be with the town. Um, and also I look forward to sort of finalizing this, this draft. I think, um, you know, working from, you know, with Selectman Arena and the proponents, I think that there's a lot of, a lot of synergies there and I think that there'll be a work product I think we can all be kind of proud of. But I do want to just make sure that we <coughs> recognize that these are not two unrelated things. These are very much related. And the fact that so many people came out and discussed this is something that I think, you know, it's not filling potholes, it's not putting teachers in classrooms, but it's something that we as town leaders really need to figure out and, <coughs> and make a priority. And that's it. Dan. Hey, I was at the HRAC meeting. I think it's been adequately reported. Senator Lewis is also an attendee there. I thought I should mention that. Uh, oh, yes. Thank, thank you, Dan. I appreciate <coughs> his uh, attending. Uh, Barry and I just met as the uh, volunteer appointment subcommittee. We are filling uh, a position on the Council on Aging this evening. We also have a nominee for uh, an associate position on the Council. I don't believe there are any candidates for the CPDC vacancy that we have seen yet. Uh, mm -hmm. And there may be others uh, coming up in the near future. So we'll, we'll stay tuned on that one. Well, just one more point on, on, um, on uh, Congressman Moulton's visit. Um, I'd be remiss if, if I didn't um, give a real big shout out to Amy Landon and her staff to really turn that around. I mean, the library was open for business, and then they closed at 2 o'clock, and by 2.45 they had the place cleared out, set up, um, more people than they had ever expected to show. And um, there were so many people from out of town, I, I made a point of talking to some, and um, the comments on the line and, and, the, and the hallway were, wow, I wish we had a library like this. So, um, yeah, good point, good point. That it was a great job by yeah. staff. Do they want to help us pay for hours? <laughs> <laughs> we, put, we put the hat out. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, as you know, I attended several of these different events with you, but, you know, we've talked enough about these tonight. You guys have done a great, very thorough job of explaining what was going on at all of them. I will, however, plug shamelessly um, the fact that the Reading Rotary Club at our high school will be hosting the Taste of Metro North. Um, that's going to be on March 29th, and it has its own Facebook page and its own website, Taste of um, Metro North. And I bring that up uh, and say it shamelessly because um, they've recruited 27 restaurants to come. We typically expect uh, three to 500 um, Reading residents and a lot of North Reading residents as well. And the other thing that's most interesting about that particular event is it's one of a handful of major fundraisers and Reading Rotary Club is puts their money all back into Reading. Uh, it's into the Reading Scholarship Funds, the Reading Education Fund, it's into, you know, Boy Scout, Girl Scout projects, it's into causes that are near and dear to the hearts of, you know, everybody, it, it really touches everybody in Reading, food pantry, um, all of those things. So, um, normally it's not a place we plug things, but this is a real civic thing that I want to plug and I urge you to go. The tickets are discounted online, um, not so that night. So, um, I think it's time for us to open this up to public comment. Okay, Dan. My name is Dan Dewar. I uh, live at 519 Main Street. I also own a business at the same address, a convenience store. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to uh, time to address the comments that were made to you before your last meeting. Um, I, I know you have a full agenda, so I'll be brief. It's my understanding that Mr. Friedman, who was recently resigned chairman of the Board of Health, spoke to you at your last meeting regarding the Board of Health's proposal to significantly expand tobacco regulations. I also understand that Mr. Freeman may have called into question my personal integrity in his comments. Frankly, I'm disappointed that the chair of a town committee 
not to mention someone who is running for election to the Board of Selectmen, as Mr. Friedman is, would go out of their way to insult the local business owner, but I will set that aside for more important business this evening. I'm the first to admit that I have made mistakes and inadvertently sold tobacco products to a minor on two occasions in the last seven years. I, I have paid the price for that, for those two sales according to the law and also the embarrassment of making a mistake. Let me say this loud and clear, it is not my desire to sell tobaccos to minors, ever, not even by accident. But I find it ironic when a public health official attacks local business owners like me for selling tobacco products, but they do nothing to make it illegal for minors to purchase, possess, or use tobacco like we do with alcohol. Reading tobacco sellers like me have a 95% compliance rate with regulations. That's the same compliance rate for local alcohol retailers, 95%. Nobody's talking about taking candy or fruit flavored barkers off the shelves and accusing them of using flavors to attract minors to drinking. The vast, the vast majority of the time we get it right. We do not sell to minors. All the talk about wanting to protect minors is just that, talk. Because the new regulations are a solution to a problem that does not, that does not exist. 100% of the minors can get tobacco from any source and smoke it as much as they like, and the Board of Health could change that to zero, but that's not on their agenda. Why? Because they're not being honest, mm -hmm. and they, they are not being open and transparent with their process. They write regulations without inviting input from the retailers, schedule a meeting, allow each person approximately three minutes to comment with no back and forth discussion. Then the Board of Health discuss it, discusses it among themselves, and they're the only ones that have a vote. No democracy there. Nobody on the Board of Health has ever come to me or any other retailer to discuss their plans. I have never been asked to present evidence that we have to back up our position, that there is a way to protect minors that will not destroy my business or harm my retirement. Here's my bottom line. Board, you guys, say you want to support local business. It says it wants to see more economic development in this town. The board says it's worried about the financial health of the community. At the same time, the Board of Health says it wants to protect minors, but their proposals fail to address the tobacco use by 80% of the minors who do, do not get their tobacco from us retailers. The Board of Health refuses to recognize the data of their proposed policy of removing e-cigarettes and flavors will actually condemn 10 to 15 million people who have no choice but to continue to smoke cigarettes and, or suffer the consequences. The Board of Health, they, they play fast and loose with the data to create the facts that they want to see. They've gone so far as to invite people from Winchester, Danvers, outside people to the town hearings at the Board of Health, despite the fact that these people have nothing to do, nothing about the retail business or doing business in Reading. I need you guys to stand with me and help me get the Board of Health to have an honest, open, and public conversation about the other side of the tobacco story and public health. I'd like you to get them to postpone their vote and have more dialogue. It's very important. One of the things that Andrew Friedman uh, said that, that, that uh, the tobacco, uh, Maury Busby, uh, I don't know what a title is, but talked to uh, all 17 of, of the retailers. Mm -hmm. Six, and one of them, me, is the only one that complained. The other 17 just accepted it that it's, it's going to happen, so you know they knew it was coming down the road. Well, I'm going to tell you that's, that's, that's not the case, because one of the guy I just talked to today, Cal up at J&K's, was on his way to India, or he would have been at that meeting with me. I just talked to him today. He's back. He would like to have some dialogue on that. There are other retailers that don't have uh, the flavors, so it doesn't mean anything to them. So, the, uh, I'm telling you, if the and the other the other retailers feel that the fix is in, that the decision is made. So why bother? We all work a million hours a week. We you know we can't waste our time on something that the fix is in. But if they want to have an open and, and fair and democratic dialogue, we would love to do that. 
Um, they moved their meeting to March 22nd. They didn't even put a time on it. I got a letter. No time on it. It's just bad communication. I mean, please, please work with me. Uh, I want to do my part to help miners. I, I, I want to be a partner. There's no partnership here whatsoever. Please ask the board of health to take, to, you know, to, to, to take a break and, and, and have more discussion. Um, I, I'm going to close with this. Andrew Freeman is quoted in an article about the upcoming election that appeared in the Reading Chronicle on March 1st, 2017, saying, my vision for the town is to have a town where issues like the override are discussed in an open and collaborative fashion, where everybody is heard, and that way we can find solutions to address the budget. I only wished he used the same logic during his tenure at the Board of Health. Thank you for your time. Yes, um, I'm sorry, your name is? My name is Dan Dewar. Hi, Dan. John Arena. Hi, John. Um, every businessman I've ever met knows his business cold. It's your lifeblood. It's the kid that you can't keep quiet and never stops, never is satisfied. Who's buying the flavored products? Um, I, I have, well, number one, I only sell to people over 21. Some people are trying to quit smoking. Some people find it um, as a nice alternative to smoking. Uh, it's a safer alternative, albeit there is probably some health issues, uh, but not quite as significant as uh, um, uh, cigarettes and, you know. But, but it's appealing to folks that are over 21. Absolutely. And so aren't the flavors. I mean. Uh, what percentage of your business you think is flavored? Right? Maybe you don't know it, but it, more than half, less than half? Yeah, right. I, I sell uh, menthol and regular to tobacco flavored right. e juice, but I would say probably 60% of it is probably flavor. Of your revenue stream. Of flavor. the revenue stream derived from that. That And, and also, that's probably my, my biggest profit center as far as uh, margin. And you said that other uh, facilities in Reading don't have it. Is there a reason they don't? Well, uh, some. Some of them, like it's a, a gas station, like the Sunoco, is just he has a few customers that he just has a yeah, few packs on. Right. Um, it, um, you know, the mobile they have a full fledged convenience store. They they have also um, um, e cigarettes, uh, not quite the degree that I have. I I just you know I lost a lot of revenue when uh, they went from eighteen to twenty one, um, so I was looking for a replacement for that. So um, you know I researched it and it looked like a good alternative, okay. um, and and it, and it has been. It's been a good. Uh, Revenue. Wow. Good. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Dan. Thanks, Dan. Thank you very much. Um, yes, ma'am. All right. Um, hi, I'm Lori Hoden, and um, I appreciate the um, opportunity to share my view of the Human Relations Advisory Committee meeting last Thursday. I appreciate that you summarize it um, nicely. Also. I'm um, Barry, I really appreciate your acknowledgement about the connection of the Human Rights Resolution in the um, Human Rights Advisory Committee. Um, so I appreciate all that and I'm hopeful that we can work together so that we can um, collaborate in the important work of um, modeling for our young people what it looks like to be a really respectful and welcoming community for all. So um, I have a just a short statement about my feelings about that meeting on Thursday. So, um, I've lived in um, Reading for 25 years and I've been a member of the Human Relations Advisory Committee for 10 years. Um, and I'm committed to ensuring that Reading is a welcoming community for all. Um, tonight, I'm speaking as an adult who cares about the world of different liaisons, um, Jess and Catherine and Ruthie. Um, they have been conscientious and engaged high school representatives for our committee for almost two years, attending monthly meetings despite very busy schedules. I've known Jess since her Joshua Eaton days um, when she was an avid reader and member of our mother-daughter book group. Jess has always been thoughtful, so while I was not surprised about, um, by her professional presentation of the survey um, data that she, Ruthie, and Catherine conducted with the full support and assistance of Principal Adam Bacher. I was proud of her courage to speak to a room full of adults, including many of the town leaders. Um, she spoke very clearly and um, candidly about the results of the survey, which talked about um, the uh, discrimination at um, Reading High School or actually in the town. 
the, the experiences of her peers. Um, I was upset that instead of um, taking responsibility for the data presented at our meeting, um, Mr. Arena contacted a member of the school committee to question the schools. The students were more than clear about their desire that the selectmen stand up to discrimination in town as to be models for the school. Jess even stated, I think the HRAC should be related to the town to serve the whole town, not just the schools. Um, I was just really concerned about taking the survey data and passing it on to the schools. Reading Memorial High School is not a bubble unto itself. Um, clearly school children learn from the choices of adult role models in the larger community. I'm also speaking as Ruthie's mom. Um, Ruthie is one of the only Jewish students in her class as we are one of a small group of Jewish families in town. I'm motivated to speak tonight because of hateful acts outside the school, like swastikas in public bathrooms in our own town, as well as an uptick in violence, um, bomb threats to Jewish community centers, um, Jewish cemeteries that have been vandalized. Um, they are a big deal to me and my family. My grandparents, Rose and Sam Hoden, immigrated from Poland in 1932. The Nazi Holocaust ravaged our family. My grandmother, Rose Hoden, was the youngest of 13 girls, and 11 of her sisters were gassed in Auschwitz. My father never knew any of his grandparents. Given the uptick in violence, um, I am fearful and looking to the leaders of the community to take a stand against hate speech that sets a fertile foundation for more destructive actions. In February, Gina Mercurio and Caitlin McCormick presented a thoughtfully constructed human rights resolution signed by 250 Reading residents. And I'm so um, pleased to hear about the ongoing conversations and the meeting that happened just yesterday. Um, there were some questions from that February meeting that I'd like to respond to. So Mr. Arena asked, um, tell me the difference, tell me what's the difference tomorrow if we pass a statement today? Um, and I would just like to say, to answer that question, it would make a big difference to me, and I would find it reassuring if the Board of Selectmen um, signed on to the Human Rights Resolution, because as leaders of our town, you're spokesmen for our values and your role models for our young people. Um, in addition, uh, Mr. Rena asked you, asked you asked also, what is an act of indifference? I asked that. Okay, I'm sorry. Correct that. Uh, Mr. Um, yeah, and cigar. Um, so um, I'm gonna. I looked it up because I thought you know it was. I'm um, assuming you asked the question because you were. Um, you didn't know. So I'm gonna quote Nobel Prize winning author and Holocaust survivor Elie Wiesel to define indifference. He says the opposite of love is not hate. It's indifference. The opposite of art is not ugliness. It's indifference. The opposite of faith is not heresy. It's indifference. Um, and I think it's our responsibility, all of our adult responsibilities, teachers in the schools, administrators in the schools, um, elected officials like yourselves, that we are really clearly taking a stand against indifference. So I ask you um, to serve as role models for our young people and make it really clear where you stand on basic human rights by collaborating with concerned citizens um, and confronting acts of hatred and intolerance whenever and wherever they are found. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Bob. I wasn't there Thursday, but obviously I, I do want to comment on one part of what you said. Um, in terms of, I don't know exactly the route that John Arena took to get information to the schools. I think he sent Gene Borowski an email. Um, I had breakfast with the superintendent today. He was very appreciative of that fact. What goes on in his school department, he needs to know. The school committee needs to know. It's their responsibility. So I don't think there was anything inappropriate like, with that. I think it was quite quite proper. And I know the superintendent believed that as well, just so you know. You have to understand that we're, we're reporters when we hear something said like that. We have an obligation to report yep. that to the to people. <clears throat> yes, Linda. I just want to point out, I'm actually um, on the school and a liaison to the Human Relations Advisory Committee, and I go back and I do present 
what goes on at our meetings, and I present at our meetings. I, I meet with the superintendent, and I present at our meetings, and you can hear my presentation last night um, at our school committee meeting as well. Okay, great. Uh, other public comment? Yes, sir. Thank you. I know you have a heavy agenda, so I'll be brief. My name is Dennis Lane. I'm not a Reading resident. I represent the Coalition for T Responsible Tobacco Retailing. I'm a retailer. I have been for 43 years. And uh, the Coalition of Responsible Tobacco Retailers has been traveling around the Commonwealth, uh, meeting with boards of health and boards of selectmen and, and interested parties to try and present a balanced view of the landscape that's affecting retailers right now. And there's no doubt that within a year or two, the entire Commonwealth will be 21 uh, age to buy. And that's not something that we choose to challenge. Um, we feel every community needs to make that decision. The thing that's happening is that retailers are facing a 40% increase in minimum wage over the past three years. Um, we all hire from the neighborhoods. A lot of kids in my neighborhood got their first job working in my store. And, but I want to tell you something that means an awful lot to me. I've been there for 43 years. The kids that were catching the school bus in my store in the 70s are coming in with their kids now. And my worst nightmare would be standing in front of a parent who used to catch the bus in my parking lot and explain why myself or one of my staff sold a pack of Marlboros to a kid. We, we, if we do that, for the buck we make on that pack of Marlboros, we lose the gallon of milk, we lose the cup of coffee, we lose the Boston Globe, we lose the customer, we lose the market basket. So I, I think there is there are two issues here. No one has really addressed in great detail that kids can purchase tobacco, uh, cannot purchase tobacco, but they can use tobacco. There are no laws in the Commonwealth about use. So any 14 or 15 year old who has a pack of cigarettes can sit on the front steps of this town hall and smoke it, and no police officer can tell them no. They can't take it away, they can't threaten to call their parents. It's also, I, I had a conversation with an agent for the federal government who does tobacco stings, and he says, it's not illegal for a minor to come to your counter and ask for cigarettes. It's illegal for you to sell, but it's not illegal for a kid who's underage to ask and hope that the clerk's not paying attention. So I think if there were purchase and use laws that were effectively reinforced by the, by the local police, that would make a huge difference. So we're traveling all around the Commonwealth, uh, you know, with the permission of Boards of Health, and folks like you here at the Selectman's meeting and trying to make a, a, a differentiation behind, between the fact that the industry wants to protect children from tobacco. We also want to protect that guy who's 30 years old on his way home from work, wants to go home and grab a Budweiser and light up a peach cigar. It's, it's, so how can we keep retailers profitable? How can we keep responsible adults' rights to buy a peach cigar without, without being overpriced for it? And I have in my pocket, I'm not going to pull them out, I have two bottles of vodka, pineapple and grape. There's 40 flavors of flavored liquor. Uh, on my way here tonight on Route 93, I went by a billboard that had Captain Morgan on it. Captain Morgan has a parrot on his arm. He's, got, he's selling spiced rum. He's a cartoon character. So, and, and, and so Joe Campbell's long gone, but Captain Morgan's out there on a billboard. And so no one's challenging, and obviously alcohol is restricted 21 plus. No one's taking flavors out of the liquor stores. But we're disadvantaging the, the Main Street American retailer. You don't want to hurt your banker. You don't want to hurt your baker. You don't want to hurt your dry cleaner. You don't want to hurt the people who give your kids jobs in your neighborhood. So what I'm asking, and I know that there's, I know that not always do the selectmen and the boards of health communicate and agree, but... As the selectman for this town, as I've asked every town I've spoken with, I'd ask you to, to carefully consider the rights of responsible adults, the rights of your retailers. I'm very proud of your retailer who came here and spoke to you tonight. This is his livelihood. It's, I'm making less money than I was 20 years ago because my profitability is just shrinking. And Obamacare, I'm not saying that's good or bad. Minimum wage, uh, I'm paying three times more for workman's comp than I was 10 years ago. It, it's, I, I used to pay 100 bucks a month to empty my dumpster, and I pay three times that now. My expenses are going up. My, my ability to be profitable are going up. So I, I just ask that you folks take a fair and balanced look at this, and if you can influence 
uh, your Board of Health to delay, have additional hearings, or get more public information, especially from retailers. And I know there's always an urban legend that retailers, this is my last statement, that retailers don't come forward. There's a good reason why retailers don't come forward. They're so afraid that after they come forward, someone from the Board of Health is going to show up with a clipboard a month yeah. later and, and ding them. So I know you guys are in a catch-22. We're all in a catch-22. We all just want to make money. We all want to pay taxes. We all want to support our community. So I'm very honored that you gave me the opportunity to speak. Thank and I'll answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right. Actually, regards uh, to Dennis and the previous speaker, what recourse does this board have to alter the course of events in our Board of Health? Persuasion. Yeah. No legal say. Yeah. We also have the power of appointment. When time comes to appointment. That's all our time comes to. Well, I understand. Uh, you know, often a reasonable conversation goes a long yeah. way. And I think it, usually, it almost yeah. always does. If yeah. it's, you know, if it's time to have a discussion about <clears throat> more public input, um, our friends at the Board of Health are not unreasonable people. We, we need to have a conversation with them. But that's the feeling of the board that um, we'd like to urge them for, to have more public input. That's a conversation, I think. And I, I think to Bob's point, it's, a, it's not about trying to make somebody do something. It's a you know, <coughs> dialogue is really, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking more, how do you open up, how do you encourage the conversation we can, we can ask? Well, I mean, conversation like we're having, like, you know, one of the previous speakers spoke about, and we've been having, you and Barry have been opening a conversation. These came as a result of public comment. And, you know, I mean, that's kind of why we have this. And, you know, I, I was, I, I mean... I know that public comment is not a statutory requirement of a selectman's <coughs> meeting, but in Reading, it is our habit um, because we think a dialogue is really important, and so that's what we're going to do. I appreciate you coming. I appreciate the opportunity. I think if you control it to 21, you solve a lot of problems. Thank you very okay, much for coming. Thank you. In. You're welcome. <laughs> um, other comment? Yes, ma'am, in the back. Um, so, my name is Jessica Squires. I live at 26 Overton. I'm one of the student liaisons between the Reading Human Relations Advisory Committee and the High School A World of Difference Club. I just wanted to read a statement kind of clarifying our purpose in the survey that I wrote. I wrote it for Linda last night. She wanted to give it to the school committee. They, she didn't have time to read it, but I just wanted to make sure that it was shared. So, as student liaisons to the Reading Human Relations Advisory Committee from the World of Difference Club at RMHS, we created and implemented this survey in order to gather data that would be useful for both the committee and our high school. After the Board of Selectmen expressed interest in the, in the prospect of the Reading Human Relations Advisory Committee gathering more responses from Reading residents about discrimination in town, we decided that conducting such a survey in our high school would be a great way to collect a large amount of data. We drafted and conducted this survey with the aid of our principal, Adam Bacher, whose help we greatly appreciate. Our survey, which was conducted in November, garnered a total of 415 respondents. With the data we now have access to, we hope to move forward in the shared mission of A World of Difference and the Human Relations Advisory Committee to ameliorate our town and school communities for all residents, regardless of race, religion, disability status, ethnicity, gender identity, sex, or sexuality. We stress Reading students express desire for their town to take action regarding discrimination through a variety of suggested methods, both proactive and in response to incidents. And I'll be meeting with Mr. Bacher this Friday to discuss some future projects for the World of Difference Club. We were supposed to meet Tuesday, but something came up in his schedule. So I look forward to continuing to work with you guys. Excellent. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Great, great work you did. Yes, yes. yes, yes. Um, Jess, how many people are in the World of Difference Club? What's the total attendance, or what do you typically draw? <coughs> I'd say the average acting group right now is about seven people. It definitely used to be much larger, but I've noticed as a whole, club participation has gone down in the schools. And is this just seniors, or is it open to other schools even? It's currently, well, there is, um, I'm pretty sure there's still a branch at the middle school, but currently the club is open to everyone in the school. We're working on recruiting more, and we, it's not only seniors. We do have some juniors, and we have had some sophomores attend our meetings, 
and we would really love to get some more people involved with it. Good. Thank you. That's great. Excellent. And you've done, I said this to you the other night, the amount of surveying you've done is tremendous. I mean, the fact that you've gotten hundreds of responses really forwards the discussion in a very positive way. I'd like to compliment you on that. Yeah. Yes, sir. Hi. I'm Tim Brooks, uh, 37 Carl Street. Been here for about 35 years. Um, I came to support Dan's position, and um, what, what I really wanted to say is you guys are, are asking Dan to police our kids. And it's the parents' responsibility to go out there and watch what the kids are doing, be it alcohol or tobacco. They could show up with a false ID and, and present it to Dan. He might not know the difference, but he'd still be responsible for selling. That problem is between the kids and their parents, and they should take the responsibility for it. Um, I, I don't know how else to say it, but if, if you push that responsibility off on somebody else, it's not going to get done. I've watched him card people because I'm a daily customer of his, and and he's re he's he's rejected kids to come in. I've I've seen him do it. He's he wants to have a, a lucrative business so he can make a living, but it belongs to the parents to keep those kids out of that situation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Comment. Yes. Aaron Calvobachi, and I by no means will disparage anyone who smokes tobacco. We are not a family that does, but to the point of policing, I went on Amazon and I could purchase flavored tobacco products. Yeah. And so I did speak before the Board of Health because I really want tobacco to be treated the same as alcohol. My children do not smoke, we're not of that family, but that doesn't mean kid, we're not going to keep kids from being able to get these products until we change the laws, whereas we can have our police treating minors in possession with tobacco the same as alcohol. That is the bigger concern. That is a very big concern to me. It's a concern that three children at the middle school were in school suspension for having vapors. And the, the irony of that is they may not be able to use them in the school, but they can use them outside of the school. And if we really want to protect our children, which I need help in protecting my children, then I need tobacco to be treated as the same as alcohol. Please. Thank you. Yes, Barry. I have a, a question for the chief on that. Um, chief. Chief, I have a question. Maybe, maybe you're not the right person to ask, but um, is if we wanted to make it in Reading, um, uh, you know, misdemeanor or, or, or crime for under 21 to possess tobacco, is that a state law, or could we do something in Reading? We'd have to check with Ray, but I don't, yeah, think, I don't think you can do that. So that, so that, even if we wanted to, we, it's, to we could work through our delegation, right? Yeah, have something done. Right. But I will make a comment. The gentleman said about the 14 and 15 year old smoking on the. Town hall right over here. I can guarantee if one of our guys shows up and there's a kid smoking over here, we'll be calling the parents and taking the cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> if the parents are upset at that, we'll be filing 51A against the parents, okay, with DCF, because I'm not going to tolerate that either. So, all right? Thank you. Thank you. We know you're doing Fair it. Very cheap. <laughs> uh, Bill, just a second. I, somebody's been waiting. Yes, sir. That's right. Hey, thank you. I'm just going to stand here because I don't have to back to anyone. Jennifer Hillary, 183 High Street. Thank you, Mr. Halsey. I'm here tonight because as I saw the last agenda come out last week, it occurred to me that there was no discussion on the agenda about the an override. And uh, it gave me pause because last year around this time, uh, as I reviewed my notes, uh, this board and the town manager were actually uh, starting these conversations in a, in a substantive way. At the end of February last year, um, our town manager had given a financial overview at this meeting and a timeline for the override was discussed. And it was also discussed what topics surrounding the override would be discussed at subsequent meetings. At the beginning of March, our town manager wrote an excellent financial overview that went into the papers. On March 8th, the Board of Selectmen actually voted on the October 18th date. Mm -hmm. And by the end of March, uh, override ethics rules were discussed. 
And I just wanted to encourage the Board of Selectmen to consider uh, a similar timeline. There are certainly different issues that this board would need to discuss uh, should an override be placed on the ballot in the fall or the spring, which includes uh, a, again a discussion of when they would like the over when you would like the override to happen, and further, uh, how are the board of selectmen going to reach out to voters to find out uh, what what would make it voters support an override in the future? I know that it's been discussed the amount of an override, but I, I think that it's not the only reason folks voted against it in the past night. And I just wanted to encourage the board to not lose momentum on this issue. I think since the financial forum in January, and I know that your agenda has been full, that, that you continue to do great work, but I really would like to see this town continue talking about this issue substantively. Thank you. Other public comment? Yes, Mr. Brown. Um, for information, anybody that wants to file an act to prohibits or uh, arrest uh, plant juvenile supply and cigarettes, they have the right to do through for this state legislature. And you have to file your legislature. I've filed several bills. They've all ended up in the trash barrel. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't even make it to committee, huh, Bill? Uh, but, you know, <laughs> it's a great committee. Yeah, <laughs> the issue that I was looking for got solved. It was on the open meeting law, so. Well, there you go. Yeah. But you, you do have that right under the Massachusetts Constitution, and he has to file it for you. Good point. And, and you have the right to sit at the public hearing. As my grandson said on the way out, they don't know who they're dealing with, do they? <laughs> <laughs> Grandson's quite a boy. <laughs> Other public comment? Yes. Then the Snow Docks or Beaver Road um, Human Rights Advisory, Human Relations Advisory Committee and the School Committee. Speaking for myself, I can't resist saying how proud I am of our students. Um, that they had the voice at our meeting and beyond to come here tonight to voice, to explain what they did with the survey. Um, I'm really proud of them. And I also wanted to elaborate a little bit on, I did give a report on um, last night and included just a lot of what you had said, although I did not read the letter. And um, I just wanted to elaborate a little bit about um, what the schools have been doing in order to empower students and um, make sure that we are addressing the needs of our community. Um, the schools have core value and character education programs in every school, have extracurricular clubs like AWOD, the GSA, and student government, speakers like Michael Fallon, Rosalind, Rosalind Wiseman, Holocaust survivors, and even this last weekend's drama production, 1776, which intentionally tried to empower our students and get them thinking about positive conversation and perseverance. We have homerooms planned with the same teacher over four years in order to nurture relationships. And the multiple tiers of student support program and challenge day programs have the goal of having every student connected with at least, least one teacher on a personal basis throughout their tenure in the schools and beyond. And the, and the biannual um, risk survey shows that that is happening, that students are connected more than ever with teachers and adults in our schools. Programs and courses like the real world problem solving, peer leaders and missing voices are also efforts to make the curriculum more meaningful and to connect students with each other across performance levels and strengths. When faced with situations and awareness, the schools have responded proactively. When hate graffiti was scribbled on the walls of a school, the whole school was involved in a combination of assemblies, peer leader programming, and classroom discussions. When a student transi transitioned gender, the schools called in a consultant from the DS DESE, did assemblies, worked with the student and their family, and offered such compassionate support that the family has publicly thanked the schools for their support and guidance. None of it, this changes the fact that these students are senior advisors, are senior, truly advisors, but are senior, a world of difference, peer leaders, 
are in the know and they still feel and their survey shows that students want and need more from the town and from the school. Hate is insidious and if people feel it, then it is real in some way. That is why there needs to be proactive programming, constant outreach and awareness and sensitivity training. Um, the schools like the town and police are confined by regulations, um, but I think that our conversations and the progress we are making is really important, and I do believe that together we'll be able to form a commission or committee, some way for us to work together to make a statement that our community supports these kids, all of our kids, in fighting hate so, thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Um, any other public comment? Hearing none, Bob? Uh, the only thing I'll mention is um, the selectman also broke the uh, law on Monday night at the CPDC meeting and three of you showed up. So was, Last week was a record with three different Well, meetings. there's no law breaking if no deliberation. I know. Happened. I'm just poking you. Yeah, um, but on CDC. Clarify that. <laughs> yeah, please clarify that. Thank you. I wasn't <laughs> in the circus otherwise. I was going to take that whole thing. <laughs> Do not take out of context. <laughs> here too, you know, we get he might arrest you. Right? <laughs> um, I think some, <laughs> some <important laughs> um, many of our neighbors and other communities in the state mm -hmm. are, I'll say, following Redding's lead, although some of them certainly started when we did. Uh, to go to the voters and or town meeting uh, to ask about marijuana, so-called recreational, commercial really marijuana. I know there's an election in one of our peer communities today. Uh, North Reading is going in the opposite direction. They have a town meeting first, special town meeting, then they're going to the voters. Um, we chose to go to the voters and just have the regular town meeting. Um, there are lots of legal opinions out there and all of them disagree with each other. So we're all doing the best we can. Great. Um, our town council is familiar with not North Reading, but another community that I didn't mention. Doesn't think their ballot question will hold up with the AG. The point is, we're in very, very uncertain times, and Reading is doing its best. Um, you know, we'll hope to get it right. We may need to come back. We don't know that. Well, don't you think, Bob? As always, you know, the voters will tell us what oh, their absolutely. opinion is. Yeah. The AG will tell us. <clears throat> whether or not their opinion, whether their opinion will be validated. Right. Um, so, you know, however that works, I think the law itself, question four, which passed, it is a law, does say that any action going forward has to be by a vote of the voters. So we have far, one of those on April 4th. So, so far, we're the only community going that extra step of uh, asking for a special act, yep. which seems appropriate given all the uncertainty. It does. Yep. Yeah. Is your view, Bob, that all the communities are aware of are all reaching to the same goal, albeit in different ways? Oh, I know. Um, they seem to be asking the, the opinion of the voters. The, all the communities I know of are mm -hmm. ones that got a no on question four. There may be others, because certainly there's logic, even if you voted yes, yes. on four, to still do no on commercial. Um, they believe their voters will vote no again, but they're willing to ask them. They feel obliged to ask them. Right. Yeah, I think, right. so I think that's where we yeah. are. We want yeah. to know what we know how they voted in November. In, yeah. in November. We want to know how they're going to vote on this specific question. Yeah. So. And actually, to, toward that, um, as, you, as you know, I, I, I have no problem asking the voters what they think on something. I just raised question about, um, you know, what kind of information are we going to provide right. to kind of give them the context and why are we doing this and sort of have it not be a surprise um, when they go to the polls on April 4th and say, well, what was this? No one talked about it. You know, Dan and I have spoken amongst ourselves and we're going to try to do something similar to what Dan did on the override, which is just kind of a FAQ. lack of a better group effort and yeah. FAQ that, you know, Al and Joanne and whoever, <clears throat> hopefully we can distribute that as many right. as much as we can. So at least people will have the context of understanding you know, what are the pros, what are the cons, why, why am I being asked to vote for this, what happens if I vote no, what happens if I vote yes, just so that they could make an educated decision. So, you know, we'll be working on that. And and just further on that, you are, now that you've voted on a ballot question, just like the override, we're in a legal period where there's different rules. Mm -hmm. um, none of them have any issues like the override does in terms of speaking out. You all have your right to your personal opinion, um, as do employees. Um, but we have to be careful about using taxpayer resources, I guess I'll say. 
that does not preclude us from putting facts up on the website. That's a perfectly reasonable right. thing to do. But it would be improper if any of you or all of you took a side and wanted Got to put it. that yep. side on the website. We can't do that. Right, right. right. It's almost like a blackout period. I think that, yeah, that, I mean, that we kind of agreed to that two yeah. weeks ago. Yes. That we yeah. want to put it, that voters need to always decide. The, the ultimate answer is comes from them. Yep. So, yeah. That's all. <coughs> One thought yes. that Barry's comment made me think, um, at some point in our past, Reading has had um, either meet the town manager or, or meet the selectman or throw water balloons at the selectman or something <laughs> on television. I think that last one would get a good, good as response. We've even been in a dunk tank, I think, at the time. Well, I don't want to tell about that. But, um, <laughs> it must be a vehicle for us to get some of this messaging out on a regular basis, even if it's five minutes a week in front of a camera, to at least get... Yeah. Notwithstanding the blackout period, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. another way to get it. At least, and it repeats. It doesn't get discarded at the night in the recycling, right? Yeah. yeah. There used to be a forum uh, which was on RCTV where all five selectmen and Peter would appear and take yeah, right, right. calls on the phone. Right. They're all from Bill. Bill so was the only phone. <laughs> <laughs> well, now that we have caller ID, yeah, yeah. well, we could do a live audience and just have Bill there. I know so. where the studio is. Bill from Reading. <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll still we'll have have All right, we can't get punchy at this early in the morning. Sure we can. <laughs> okay, that's it. You good? That's all. Thank you. Okay. So um, it looks like we're, we have an appointment. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Yes, good? please. Uh, this evening, uh, the volunteer appointment subcommittee interviewed two candidates for the Council on Aging, uh, Joan Coco, who is a 44-year-old year resident of Reading. Uh, she's been active down at the Senior Center. Her husband's been very active in town politics, uh, her husband Dick. And uh, Janice Stafford, 13-year uh, Reading resident with a legal background, uh, great interest in uh, uh, pro bono work for the elderly and the poor. Uh, so both candidates presented tonight and uh, we have made, uh, I'll make the motion as we have recommended. Move that the Board of Selectmen accept the recommendation of the Volunteer Appointment Subcommittee as follows. Joan Coco to a position on the Council on Aging with a term expiring June 30th, 2019, and Janice Stafford, an associate position on the Council on Aging for a term expiring June 30th, 2017. It was a difficult decision, but uh, we felt we'd go in this direction, and Janice certainly would be uh, a prime candidate to move up should there be any other. Both agreed that they would take either position. They, they did, we asked okay. both. Okay. Yeah. Any further discussion? We need a second. We don't have a second. Second. All right. Any further discussion? Two good candidates. Lucky to have them both. Yes. Good. Amen. Great. Always happy when the volunteers come. Okay. Um, if I hear no other discussion, then will all those in favor? Okay. 5 0. On we go. To the, uh, oh, no. Sorry, we're, 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 we're running a little late, Colleen, but you're on. Yeah. Thank you for the public comment, too. We Thank do you appreciate much. you coming. Have a good evening. Right. Good night. By the way, Paul, I have just immense respect for your ability to take minutes because I look at my notes after two and a half hours, I feel about this much. <laughs> How you do it? <laughs> <laughs> it was the saint. It's the reason we don't pay you anything. That's right. They capture. Before I start, I just wanted to say I had the opportunity to go down to the uh, American Public Power um, Legislative Rally down in Washington. It's the first time I've been. I had an opportunity to meet with all the senators and the congressmen, Moulton, and um, to discuss, um, you know, uh, where the municipals are with respect to all of the changes that are going through ISO and those things that affect uh, the independent operating utilities or investor-owned utilities and to make sure that they understand our exemptions uh, and, um, you know, and to protect the locally controlled and locally owned mm -hmm. municipals throughout the state. So it was a, a very enlightening, um, it was a very enlightening trip. So How many um, independently operated municipals are there in the state of Massachusetts? There's 42 yeah. in the state of Massachusetts. Wow. Wow. So um, it was a great group, and yeah, it. Um, yeah. Um, but we don't always have the opportunity for FaceTime with the ISO. You know, they meet on a regular basis with 
uh, with the congressman, and um, so it's the American Public Power does a rally throughout the country to make sure that they understand that, you know, we're vertically integrated. We're not set up. You know, we, we don't have a large race rate base, and um, and we, we do have a lot of exemptions from um, the different types of regulations that are that control the. Uh, How the long was the event? So. Uh, three days. It was uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So. Anyways, okay. Well, um, thanks for having us. Uh, this is uh, our second um, biannual uh, meeting. Uh, so far, we've met with each of the town managers, and this complete. This tonight will complete our third selectman presentation. Uh, we have one more to go, which is in North Reading, and that's scheduled for April 18th. Um, I don't want to reiterate what we've done because we have the pleasure of presenting a more, um, you know. Uh, fine-tuned presentation at the town meeting. So I just want to go through some of the highlights of things that have been happening since that. Um, I do want to stop, start again with just reiterating our Shred the Peak um, campaign. Um, you know, we, we try to reach out through Twitter, um, reverse 911 uh, emails. Uh, during the summer, we have a number of peaks, and that whatever is the annual peak ends up setting the rate for the entire year is integral to the rate setting so um, we we invite our customers we've gone from you know maybe a couple of hundred um, Twitter all the way up to 900 and something so far so we're reaching out to a lot of people and you know that curtailment during the um, during the peak hours really does help everyone in the town in, in everyone's rate so we're, we're going to continue that campaign do you have um, a chart you'll share with the periods of time during the year when you've been above your, your intermediate load well, typically, I don't have that slide with me. We, we can certainly send that's you fine. one. But typically, we'll have, I think last year, we had several peaks. So OK, they, they call it, this is going to be our peak. And then maybe a couple days later, there's, another, there's a hotter day. And then Primarily there's another summer. peak. So there might be five or six peaks. And then <coughs> the ISO will say, OK, this is it. And whether or not it's coincident uh, exactly with Reading. And then it's calculated out from there. But I mean, Gain will go through quickly the number mm -hmm. of programs that we have on how we, we shred the peak. We have some that are internal. We have some with our customers, with our residential customers. So we, we work with all the rate classes, including uh, taking responsibility at RMLD to make sure that we can lower it as well. Um, so I have with me tonight Jane Parento and uh, Hamid Jafari. Uh, they are my assistants and uh, the directors of our largest divisions, Integrated Resources and um, Engineering and Operations, respectively. And I would like to give them an opportunity to speak on some of the RMLD successes under their direction. So I'm going to turn it over to Jane first. I can just speak right here. Is that fine? Okay. Yeah, that's that's Thank you. Yeah, pick you. Uh, Thank you very much. So some of the things that we've been working on in integrated resources is um, community solar. Um, in a couple of slides, I'll tell you what the uh, an actual uh, project that we have up and it's installed, and we have membership in that. Um, but we also are reaching out to the four communities that we serve, and if there's an interest for us to partner up and to explore opportunities to use town buildings or facilities, we're more than happy to do that. Um, and Colleen will follow up with Bob if that's something that um, the town of Reading is interested to do in the future. Um, if we were to do an RFP, um, we just want to emphasize that the fin financials are really dependent on the site, the structure of the roof, how large the array is, the type of array, whether it's a canopy, roof mount, uh, that all plays into the financial incentives. And it's very important to realize, because we're a municipal light department and we're vertically integrated, Vendors cannot come in and supply electricity to our customers. So the light department has to buy the offtake of the power, um, and either the town or a commercial customer would receive either roofing uh, infrastructure benefits, a new roof, a lease payment, and the town would uh, be uh, receive property taxes for that equipment on top of the roof. So it's important that all three components work collaboratively so that um, it, it becomes a workable and feasible um, opportunity. Um, we are working with, uh, we do have a commercial site in Wilmington. We have a 1,000 megawatts where we have 500 customers within our service territory who have signed up for community solar. Uh, there's been about 169 Reading residents who have participated in that. 
and that's pretty reflective of the customer base. It's about 34% of the 500, and that's reflective of the demographics of how many customers are in Reading versus the surrounding towns. Jane, did you just say that the solar output from that project is 1,000 megawatts? A thousand, a thousand kilowatts. Excuse me. Oh, it's, it's, that's a, excuse me. It's that's one, like a power plant. Yeah. It's. A, I, I apologize. It's okay. one megawatt, Dan. Thank you. At high noon in the summer. Yes. Uh, two questions. Sure. Do you have a total cost of ownership assessment for that plan or any similar plan that would show not only the commercial cost but the operating cost as well as the cost of decommissioning? And, and for example, the um, net effect, the effect of net metering mm -hmm. on the on the pricing paid and, and the benefit delivered. I'm just curious because one of the big questions here is what are the real economics? You don't, you don't need to an give us. Sure. That. I'm just curious if you have one we could get later. Yeah, we we we've done. Uh, we'd be happy to share that with you. Yeah. We we've done some preliminary um, on some of the some of them are cost sensitive, so we couldn't take a specific project and divulge to the financials of that. But we can give you kind of an overview of general what we've seen in the solar markets. Does it work without net metering? the economics favor installation of a solar array in New England without net metering? Um, well, it works for us because of the way we're structuring this project. So the way we've structured community solar is customers actually are buying or are responsible for the cost and benefits of that power. So if, if we take the example that we have in Wilmington right now, uh, we've signed a, a purchase power agreement for um, the offtake of that power, and it's at a slight premium over what our average costs or our fuel charge is right now. So during the first year, it's projected that those customers will pay approximately a $5 premium um, for that benefit of that solar project within our service territory. Um, it's also projected because solar is on during our peak period which is the summer uh, those participants who have signed up for that project would receive the benefit in terms of the capacity and the transmission savings associated with that and so the models that we have forecasted over a 10-year period those customers are forecasted to receive overall about a three hundred dollar um, payment above and beyond the $60 premium that they're paying in the first 12 months. So you're pricing it just above the cost of fuel to generate the same amount of capacity. Correct. It's essentially an extension of the, of the power production base. Correct. But you don't have the capital cost to build it or the cost to decommission it and that total cost of operating. Uh, no, because the developer owns owns the solar. I see. The RMLD does not take ownership of and that. you're not bearing that cost either. Okay. Correct. All right. Hmm. Yes, Good. Can I just you. ask a quick question? Sure. I know the, the economics change all the time, but how do tax credits play in now? Are they a factor? Um, they are a factor, and I think they've been extended the, for the tax incentive credits That's what I um, through the end of uh, 2017 or 18, and it all depends okay. with the new uh, regime. But they, but those are definitely factors, okay. along with the state incentives for the SREX, and that is being changing as well. So it, it's a moving target, and you know, one project may not be exactly the same as the second project because of the timing and the market and the uh, infrastructure. Did I understand you to say this is actually generating REX as well, this, this program? Renew renewable energy credits? Correct, because it's solar. And the are we monetizing something. those or what are we doing? The vendor, the vendor retains those be in order to finance right. the project. Uh, so if I can follow at sense. one point, I don't, I don't know if it's true today, we needed the third partner for that reason, it was the tax credits. It doesn't Correct. do you any good, it doesn't do us any good, otherwise we could own the asset. Of course, we then wouldn't get property tax either. We also have the expense of installing it. Right. Yeah. The right. So they keep the RECs to pay for the, the capital. And yeah. the theory is that the tax credits are worth more right. than the cost of installation. Correct. Because everything else is internal to us. Correct. You want to pay in the operating cost, but the magic is in the RECs. And the right. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Sure. Sorry for the question. No, no. Those are all great questions. Um, Going on to the cost of service, uh, when Colleen came uh, three years ago, we had a mid-year rate increase, which was very problematic for a lot of the communities we serve, as well as our customers. Um, Colleen has installed a, a cost of service requirement every three years. This is the year that we're actually doing the cost of service. Um, we're in the process, as well as the town, of doing our annual budgets. Um, those are being put together and um, put into the model for the cost of service. So those will be presented with our, both our operating and our capital budget to our Citizens Advisory Board as well as our board. Uh, per the 20-year agreement, those budgets need to get out to the CAB by March 31st. 
So we're working very diligently um, in, in, in tangent with the cost of service. Uh, based on last year's uh, preliminary six-year uh, model, uh, we're, we're um, estimating a approximately three to four percent overall increase um, in our, our cost to our consumers uh, beginning on July 1st. That's three percent in year one and it carries forward or three percent nope. cumulative? Just three percent for that year one. Just a step function in its Correct. Okay. Correct. Can you, can you sort of lay out, um, even with that rate increase, I know we had one last year and we didn't have one this year, um, what the comparative cost of electricity is to the average homeowner in Reading with RMLD versus if we had, you know, another carrier or like with Stone or Wake or Wake sure. Wakefield has their own. But, um, um, it's, it's significant. Uh, if, if, if someone who is served, um, who uses, uh, this is just a December comparison, and again, rates change for us uh, on a monthly basis because of the fact that our fuel, we, we're tracking our fuel, and we have a deferred fuel reserve cash account. Um, so in the, in, in the winter time, it may be up slightly because of the gas shortage within the New England, and then it decreases this month, it just dropped by a quarter. So they, they, they change somewhat. Um, is that a revolving account? Is that the way to think of that? <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's, it's a way to stabilize our fuel charts. Stabilization. Yeah. Correct. Right, thank you. So we don't have huge uh, spikes for our customers. So for example, in December, an average customer who used 750 kilowatts paid $110 to the RMLD uh, for their electricity use. Uh, if they were in national grid service territory, they would spend about $153. Um, and if they were in Boston, Edison, it, it would be 148. Yes. So. Well, and since all this power comes from the same dam or the same source or the same similar arrays, this is all essentially better operating costs. You guys are you're starting with the same raw materials, right? You're paying largely the same fuel costs to generate it or to buy it. So the, the, the cost down, the thing Barry's spoken at, is you guys are just better at delivering. You well, it, it's twofold it. because uh, investor-owned utilities are no longer vertically integrated, so they have to go on the spot market every six months for standard offer. Um, so their model is slightly different than what we're allowed. We have a portfolio of resources. I see. You can buy when it's smart to buy. That we can manage, and then that was savings. Again, power supply for our customers is a complete pass-through. RMLD does not make any profit on the power supply. So we negotiate the best deals that we can and pass those savings on to our, cus so, our customers. So I have a question for you. So sure. how do we take that information, which I, 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 know, I know that information. Um, I don't know if... First of all, I'm glad to hear we're saying it when a lot of people actually watch this this broadcast. Um, I'm, I'm glad people get to realize the, the efficiency and the cost savings that you're delivering. So my, my next question to you is, how do we partner with our economic development officer to take this, take this information and take this show on the road? Because, you know, when you think about it, there are really three things that cause developers to look at major projects. And, you know, one of them is transportation, the other one is location, and the other one is energy costs. And the, the kind of person that, you know, should be locating because of transportation and location happens to have the best deal in the state. I think um, on energy. So I'm suggesting we need to take this show on the road. Here's our show. This is uh, this is actually a slide that we used um, a couple of years ago. It's been right, and we went to Wilmington and um, Osram, Sylvania was going to relocate to yeah. five different towns, mm -hmm. and so Jane and I went in and and we went through everything that we had to offer. Um, and they ended up picking Wilmington, which was um, awesome. great. I for bet economic this was a driving reason for that to happen. It was. It was. I've heard that from other it was. Oh. And um, and so you know, we got into you know when we were discussing it with them, we went into each one of these in in detail so they could understand you know where their production. And they were going to start off with businesses and then possibly add production going yep. down. So we're hopeful with our key accounts program and, and everyone in Jane's group that we we nurture that. You know, um, I have a slide right here that. Jane can go over as well. These are some of the efficiency and peak reduction measures that, you know, we have the incentives with our customers that if they want to reduce during peak, I mean, yes. if they can shift their, 
their operations or curtail, you know, uh, the arm, you know, we were able to provide a benefit back to them on the money that's saved. Um, we also have a 2.5 megawatt gener so generator. Megawatt or kilowatt? Megawatt. 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 Okay. It's diesel. Oh. Um, okay. uh, gas. <laughs> uh, gas, yeah. That's getting installed in North Reading okay. in yeah. June. By June. 10th. By June. Saturday. So that'll be like something that we can, uh, you know, control, and then you know we offer programs to our customers so that they can control. So we have a kind of a uh, you know, portfolio. portfolio. Well, you know, intuitively, I know all five of us talk about what you do. You know, when we're when we're trying to talk. You know, talk to you know developers about right. the right kinds of projects to have here. So I think the idea of, I mean, knowing it intuitively, saying it is one thing. Putting a professional presentation together, we've got right. now a person that we've brought on our team, and you already have a team. So yeah. I, I think it would be very important for us to partner at this point right. and, uh, Absolutely. and take the show on the road. We're actually meeting. I mean, a, a lot has come out of this legislative rally, and, and and you know, because there's a lot of changes coming down the pike. As we talked last year, capacity and transmission is increasing. We're at the end of the pipeline, so this particular area gets hit with a lot of the highest rates in the in the country, and uh, we just try to mitigate that. Especially if, as I said, if they start trying to put things onto the ISO, or the ISO starts changing things yeah. that could adversely impact us. Um, so Are you we're, we're to working. The, the long-term plan of, of the state to rely on the hydropower and uh, offshore. Yeah, those. Two, yeah, we're going to be talking about those. You're going to go over that meet. when you're present. Yeah, I just okay. no, I I just wrote letters to all of everyone in the state uh, on that issue, and, and we have some meetings coming up on what that. Is your but position? Um, personally, uh, sure. or on okay, uh, well, uh, there's a lot of. Um, Municipals that uh, not a lot, but there are some municipals who feel like taking the taking a declaratory judgment stance uh, on authority to say we're exempt from that. Mm -hmm. And and while uh, the RMLD is is part of that, I we've also written letters to say, but we would like to sit down and discuss how we can tell you how we can get there instead of you telling us like how that. we're going to get mm -hmm. there. Because the, 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 the authoritative approach, and I think Jane and Hamid are both with me on this, the authoritative approach is, is fine, but it's, it's not necessarily best business practice, and it's, it is going to come down the pike, and I'd much sure. rather lay out our own roadmap than have someone tell me how to do it, because then it's going to make, be tough, and it's going to be expensive, yep, and, exactly. and um, so that's my approach. That's with the letters that we're sending out. But tomorrow we're meeting with... Um, Peter Milano, who is the state's um, economic development. Right outside, right up here. Right up here. Yeah, Mr. <laughs> economic Development. Right up here. Oh. Right up here. <laughs> Power um, and development. <laughs> so Peter Milano is meeting. Uh, we're, we've kind of teamed up with Energy New England and Vin Ragucci um, that lives in North Reading, and we're going to be meeting with the state. And, and certainly each of the towns that we uh, service has a different perspective on um, economic development, you know what I mean? You know, Linfield is different from Reading and different from Wilmington, whatever. So we're very careful to make sure that we work with the towns to see what the towns want to do. One of the meetings, why, reasons why we're meeting with Peter is to really just find out what the state's process is, what, what are the elements that they look at when they're placing someone or whatever so that we're able to provide them with our lists, um, you know, so that when they come talk to the town, it's kind of, it, it's kind of a, a, a dialogue that's already occurring between, um, hi, I've yes, never met Andrew. you. Hi, Andrew, <laughs> nice to meet you. Colleen. I'm Colleen, Andrew. this is Jane and Hamid. We're, we're on our biannual RMLD update. So that's, um, do you know Paul, Paul Marie, Molino? Peter Molino. Peter Milano. Milano, that's it. Yeah, we're getting lunch next week. Oh, lunch, oh, we got him first then. <laughs> we got him tomorrow. <laughs> So uh, I'll have Jane give you a call, and we can give you some feedback of our meet. Okay, great, great. Okay, I'm sorry, Jane. Go ahead, take it, take it back. Oh, so um, as Colleen said, when we met with Wilmington and Osram, and they were contemplating whether they wanted to locate in New Hampshire in Wilmington or another uh, facility, we kind of went over some of the the programs that we have. And so uh, RMLD's commercial rebate structure is based on peak demand reduction. So we'll give commercial customers up to a $50,000 rebate 
depending on the application and how much peak reduction that, that benefits RMLD as well as all our consumers. Uh, we have a commercial lighting initiative program where we'll pay up to $20,000 uh, for LED lighting upgrades. We've worked with the town, uh, we did the Joshua Eaton School, we've one, done some buildings. So we work collaboratively um, and that co commercial customers are able to get $20,000 per year um, to make those upgrades. Um, so we would welcome that opportunity to uh, investigate other opportunities here in Reading. Um, we have, uh, we're rolling out a residential appliance rebate program right now. We're, uh, one of Colleen's missions is to kind of go paperless. Um, so right now the rebate program is if someone wants to buy an energy efficiency rebate, they have to print out a piece of paper, yeah. fill out the application, yeah. mail it yeah. into the anomaly. It's very cumbersome. What's wrong with this picture? Right. So we're hoping to outweigh uh, a web-based online system where people can go submit the information and it will be more efficient, um, mm -hmm. more productive, um, <clears throat> and it'll be better for our consumers. One of the problems we have with conservation, like putting LED lights in, is it actually raises the incremental rates. You must have the same problem. People buy less power, you have to put your fixed cost mm -hmm. over a smaller variable pool. Yep, and that's why we have programs like our electric vehicle charging station, uh, where we're trying to promote um, kilowatt hour usage off peak. Uh, so what we're doing is if that really takes off, that could be a very uh, beneficial factor in terms of increasing kilowatt hour sales for the RMLD. So we could spread those, continue to spread those costs over a larger. I guess that makes sense. I was just confused why you'd want to turn lights off on one hand and sell power a different way on the other hand. Well, because it's just when you use it. So right. just that peak period is, it's a short window of time where we're charged a large amount of money yep. to carry that for an entire year. Um, but um, if you get heat pumps and you're able to use, if we can take away from the oil company, during the winter period and, and sell electricity. It's more cost effective, it's more efficient. And so we're exploring opportunities for RLD, where do we go in the next generation? Because you're right, efficiency erodes our, our kilowatt hour sales. And if you look historically, our sales have been flat to declining over the last 10 years. Um, and so we're looking at ways, you know, the model's changing. What's gonna be the next thing for us to um, sell more kilowatt hours. And that 50K number of savings you mentioned earlier, what's that as a percentage of savings? It's 50K dollars, but in terms of the total spend, how much does it reduce? It's 50K of what larger number? Um, that's that's the maximum uh, rebate that we'll allow. Right. Um, so for every megawatt that we're able to reduce based on current capacity and transmission charges, uh, the RLD saves about $192,000. No, he said the fifty thousand dollar rebate. Yeah, but I'm just trying to give him a megawatt. for every megawatt, and and so it's power, not energy. Correct. Okay. You, you may know this, but we are working actively with North Reading to furnish MWRA water, yeah. uh, which should uh, make their industrial okay. growth mm -hmm. capacity right. surge. In we we actually heard that, and and that that the selectmen were very um, involved with yes. North Reading being able to connect in, and that was... So we figured out how to mix great. water and electricity. Yeah, great. <laughs> right, right. Perfect. Thank um, you. One thought that, to trigger off John's comment, Just this is a wonderful pitch, but it almost takes somebody that knows the nuances and the details. I almost want a headline that says, 50% lower energy cost when you move to Reading. It's, it's, the, it's part of the Andrew pitch about why Reading, and it's probably on page three or four that says lower energy costs, mm -hmm. and the bumper sticker reads, Whatever it is, thirty percent lower cost, forty percent lower cost in Boston or Haverhill. Or blah, blah, blah. Right, right. Just we go thought. back to it, that. It just grabs the eyeballs, right, and then you can continue the conversation. Yeah. Uh, I was. Just, you want to talk about the Vo uh, Volkswagen? I went by it. Oh yeah. The, um, the, as a result, yeah, as a right. result of the Volkswagen settlement for oh, their yeah. emissions, yeah. Uh, they oh, donated okay. two billion dollars for donated. Um, donated. <laughs> donated. Excuse me. <laughs> I'm sure they're required they, to pay. Mitigated. Excuse me. My words aren't coming out <laughs> appropriately today. Um, two billion dollars towards non-emitting fuels. Uh, so that we're working with the Depart uh, Massachusetts DOER, and what they're doing is they're doing quick, uh, quick win programs for electric charging stations. Well, they'll pay the full cost of the station plus installation. Uh, so we submitted um, preliminary proposals for 10 different stations. Um, they did first round, uh, they're gonna do it in 30 month increments. Um, so in the first month, the only municipality that was selected was Wellesley because they actually had a site right on the highway. Um, and so they're looking for easy access on and off, which, which is very beneficial, especially on Walkersbrook Drive, um, right off of that. And we looked just kind of down this end of um, Main Street as well. 
So we sent, uh, we submitted some preliminary, and we're hoping to hear back from the DOER. Are, are you limited to charging stations? If, if I would think you'd go right after kind of bulk storage and try to do some more load shifting. There's also grants that we're applying for that have a combination of solar, EV charging stations, and battery storage. Um, so there's there's a lot of opportunities out there, okay. and can any of that two billion be used for that or no? I think that's just charging stations, uh, because because it was um, Volkswagen. Get those Teslas going. Yeah. Open a dealership. Yes, we'd like economic development. We want data world built behind exactly. us. Data server farms, dog, oh, yeah. dog park. We're going to do our best to get the uh, research. Research. That. There, there is a certain park. kind research of triangle park right out there. Yeah. That's what we need. That, data there's world. There's a certain kind of project that RTP is perfect for this park. town. It has a ring to it. And <laughs> it, it comes in a couple of different flavors, actually. Yeah. Well, data server farms behind us would be perfect. You know what I mean? And yeah. Yep. Call it data world. It would be great. They don't use a lot of public safety. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Bill. Uh, Colleen, um, you, you people are sitting on some of the most valuable property in this town. Uh, has there ever been any thought to moving out of that site and perhaps into a less expensive site? I guess uh, we were waiting to see. That's one of the areas that the MAPC in the town yes. did an economic right. development yeah. study on, yeah. if, if and um, and yeah, the building we're in was knocked down. So, but we're, and so we're very, uh, like even with the capital budget, we're only looking at small repairs. You know, yeah. fixing the roof, and we we did do a little painting, but we're we're very careful well, about not doing yeah. anything to see if that Good. area gets uh, yeah. developed. You, you've got considerable nice lot of property up underneath the other power lines up on West Street. And it's also an abutting property in West Street that's been uh, sitting there vacant for a good many years. And it's dead. You could probably fit everything you can put up there. Is that true? It's property from West Street? It's a pool yard so far. Yeah. yeah. But I don't, I don't know uh, up the wetlands or I, I don't know the, um, the layout no. as, far as, as far as building property. But we'll, um, we'll fill it in for you. Okay, but just rest assured that we're only doing the bare minimal, um, waiting for data world. Anyways, it's very enlightening. Please continue. Okay, so now I'm going to turn it over to Hamid. We're going to talk about any more questions for Jane. Yes, hi. I'm Hamid Jafari, director of engineering operations, and um, pleased to uh, do the presentation of the maintenance programs and also some of the programs that RMD has initiated. We continue to uh, address the maintenance required uh, in order to maintain our assets in at RMLD throughout the service territory. The, uh, these are the based on the base, basically the programs based on the best business practices and models in our industry. So we have a comprehensive substation maintenance program, basically cyclic uh, t testing of the substation equipment within all these three substations. We've got the Station 3, Station 4 in North Reading, Station 3 in uh, Station three North Reading, Station 4 in Reading, and Station 5 in Wilmington. And uh, every three years, we do the cyclic maintenance of the transformers, the breakers, and some of the other assets. We do them on it, like battery testing within a year, year just to make sure we keep them up uh, to uh, improve the reliability. Uh, we created our technical services group division three years ago, four years ago, when Colin and I we joined uh, RMLD, and now uh, I'm uh, proud to announce that our team now they're full, they're trained, and they're still being trained uh, in order to take some of the testing uh, initiatives. And uh, we purchased uh, uh, the testing equipment for them, so it's going to it's going to save us substantial. Uh, testing uh, costs that uh, we, have, we have to hire outside consultant to do. So Tech Service is going to be able to do those in the future. We developed and re revitalized the system maintenance program. We got eight maintenance programs basically in order to maintain our assets in the best uh, operating conditions. Uh, transformer replacement program, this is something that you know we noticed that we got like about 3,600, 3,800 transformers and about 1,800 transformers that they're aging, they are approaching the transformers over 20 years of uh, old ser service basically. They're going to have to eventually phased out and we have uh, started the transformer load management depending on the load and the age combination. So far we've replaced 332 out of the 1866 
Uh, we have a poll testing program, which basically we own uh, 60 the custodial of the services, uh, uh, custodial polls in our service territory, about 6,500 polls, which by uh, law, basically, we test 10% of our custodial every year, every year, and uh, within 10, 10 years period, we have to basically uh, make sure that all 60 half, 6,500 polls are tested. I have to ask and you, how do you test the poll? Structural integrity? Oh, yeah, yeah there's, like, there's, like, there's a resistant test but that, you know, we, we oh, do, that's okay. and the probes that we yeah. do at the bottom of the poll, and we, uh, we measure the uh, moisture, the moisture okay. of the and, and how much it tells us what the, there's also yeah. sonar capability that yeah. the new technology, that the sonar you could uh, tell with the, the pole has inside as rotten or dicky, has Thank been decayed. Hmm. So we do that too for the public safety and the safety of our employees. So, so far, you know, we've had all of those devil poles that you see in, uh, that result in the construction operating mm -hmm. poles mm -hmm. as well as the result of the, the testing program that we have implemented, and we found quite a few polls that basically they failed, the condemned, and as soon as we find those, they immediately being replaced. To the and telecom people work in a timely way, that's kind of a joke. That's to, to our, move the wires. This yeah. is our biggest challenge because yeah. you know Verizon is getting out of the business, poll business, they're trying to oh, get into the polls, uh -huh. and they've approached us too for <coughs> negotiating about yeah, taking over. They, ha they don't have the maintenance program, uh, like us, we do, you know, uh, you do not take trimming. them seriously. Yeah. yeah, that's that's the problem. That's part of the problem. <laughs> Other maintenance programs, uh, program that we initiated uh, in order to maintain our underground assets is the manhole inspection. We have done 961 manhole uh, inspections. Uh, over the, uh, we have about 1,200, so we've got about approximately 240 more uh, left to do 300 almost. So, and throughout this inspection, we found some problems that, you know, we immediately either addressed or they're scheduled to be addressed, so to make sure we increase the reliability. The tree trimming, it's a three-year cyclic program, and to, through that, you know, our strategy is to do the main feeders, main lines, main roads first, and then we get to the laterals, uh, so we can keep those clear. So I have a question for you. When, um, as a as the snow was coming, right. we had that little weeks worth of snow, yes. and, it, and and you know on one of those storms we knew it was going to be heavy right. snow. There was somebody wandering around my neighborhood with a computer, right. taking pictures of the trees. Yes. And now is that you guys? We, yes, we got DRG. Davis I thought it was a great school. idea. But Davis, it's a contractor of ours. They yeah. collect the information for GIS. Yeah. We have uh, we're collecting data, as you know, the GIS. We have a GIS, but the GIS wasn't maintained for so long, so the right. data was kind of, you know, yeah. we couldn't rely on data. So Colin and I, we hired this DRG group so we can collect all of our assets and create a new database so we can maintain moving forward. And that project is underway. So you see these guys, they're hmm. going around the neighborhood. Yeah. So it wasn't tied to the it. weather coming in. No. And the trees. <laughs> it's just that's part of a, yeah. a bigger program. Exactly. Part yeah. of the program. Yeah. They didn't have a snow clause. Get out there. And yeah. yeah. <laughs> I just thought it was uh, I thought it was ironic that right. we were, mm. and, and there was a lot of trees that yes. hang over the, as you know. I yes. mean, our we are the city of trees. And you know, that's um, part of the problem that they're causing they're posing the reliability threats to our system because most of the main roads we got these uh, large pine trees, right. shallow roots, and you know with one the wind and the right. storm. They come down and they make extensive damage to our, you know, yes. assets. Uh, the pole, pole right. lines, They come down and you know, but that's nature. You know, yeah. you love the nature. Can't do anything about that. I mean, a while ago, I seem to recall you had a ten-year. Um, you cut to anticipate a ten-year regrowth. The, the amount of growth around. The yeah, the growth. What what we did we, when, it, when it came on board, it used to be five feet and yes. increased that I'm to sorry, seven it was ten feet. feet. It was yeah. Yeah, there's some utilities, they do address it, but this is a tree city of America, yeah. we have great respect yeah. for that, yeah. so we go on seven foot. You eight know, feet. So it's eight not a full hair. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so we know how sensitive the people are. We try to, you know, to... It's not a buzz cut, it's yeah. kind of totally cool <laughs> on this. Yeah. <laughs> try to keep everybody happy. Every, okay. <laughs> Good luck. So, thank you. <laughs> the porcelain cutouts replacement, approximately 91% replaced. We got a quarterly inspection of the other line, 13.8 kV and 35 kV, that the other crews continuously be cruising around. If you see yep. them, they're driving around and going here, they're, they're patrolling the lines, uh, looking yep. for signs of trouble or uh, for premature failure so we can get to them before they happen. 
uh, infrared scan at the substations and major underground. This is a new program we offer. Believe it or not, this program has saved us so much, uh, you know, the, the, the trouble that you know could have caused be, be very costly. Uh, with the infrared camera, we go inside the substations and find a hot spot, hot spot, a trouble spot. We go to the major parks that are big customers, and if we see any sign of trouble, we take them out of the service and we replace them, upgrade them as necessary. The secondary main and services upgrade, this is another program that Kong uh, now we initiated in order to address all the old infrastructures of the secondary the services, uh, so uh, we can, you know, we can improve those. The next slide is, any questions on those, on the this maintenance is, programs? No, this is fine, this is actually where I want to go. Oh now. yeah. Oh yeah, okay. good. The LED street lighting, you know, we got a grant that, you know, over a period of, we started the uh, replacement of the, 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 at the pilot program in F515, 300 lights. In Reading, we installed 114. So we went around and, you know, to the communities and everybody really liked them. So what we, we, we did, we continued doing that, and uh, the program officially started in FY16, and it's going to end in <laughs> FY18. Every year, we're replacing uh, 2,450 2, lights uh, for a total of uh, you know, 8,000 at the end of the day one, once we're done with it. So in uh, Reading along FY16, we replaced 961, and in uh, FY17, we replaced 573 uh, yeah, the yeah, lights to date. So yesterday, and, uh, what stops us from doing more of those or doing them more, more quickly? Is it just stand? no. We're going to do that. No, well, the thing is, we got we got a program that you know we do other reliability projects that we're going to have yeah. to do as well. So we are installing 65 lights a week uh, throughout all communities. And that's the entire fixture, or just the yeah? We replace we replace the whole thing, the whole bal ballast, everything. Okay. Not not the arm. Yeah. Not the arm. Right. The head. Do we know an average cost savings for these for, yep, for the town? I'm going to let Jane. Jane is going to go to okay, the great. Now, based on uh, the current formula rate that we have uh, on, and the different types of fixtures that the town of Reading has, you have 15 watt, 50 watt high pressure sodiums, 100 watt, 250, and 40. Those are being replaced with 25 watt LEDs and 93 watt LEDs. So the projected savings over the course of the entire upgrade for the town of Reading is um, around $51,300 per year. Of course, the annual. Wow, we budgeted what was it a hundred and a quarter, Bob? I think I remember from the. Look, there's a couple parts to it. One eighty, I think, was the total traffic lights and street lights. So right. Okay. And it, the um, pretty good dent. What these lights are producing? I know. I know. We we still have um, a lot of poles turned off. Correct, Bob. Um, I don't think so. No. Didn't we, didn't we used to have a program where we turn turned poles off. turned off for a while? Right. We had. Okay. Uh, we've oh, we've we've since right. re reinstilled those. We when we started the program, I met with the chief. We went around to the ones that were shut off, and we he wanted them turned back on. So we, oh, okay. we turned them back on. Okay. In I wasn't North aware Reading, of that. Okay. there was a significant amount that were turned off, and and now those are being turned back on. Okay. So those have all been resolved. And um, okay, so that number is with all those lights on. Yes. Okay. Yep. Bill, you had a question. Yeah. Who owns the street lights? I've been told one time that we own them. I've been told that the light department owns them. Does anybody know who actually owns them? Yeah, it's the asset of the RMLD, but you you. You buy the energy. We, we pay for the energy. We just pay for the energy. Yeah. I was told one time when I was a commissioner that we, uh, the town owned it, so I don't know. I don't think so. I was told the town owned something. I'll tell you what, these LEDs, when they put them in here, you got I mean, you can't turn them all on. You're going to wear your sunglasses. I mean, <laughs> yeah. The difference in lighting is mm. stunning. Yeah. So that savings, you said it was 51,300. What, what is the before number? It's 51,000 savings. I can't see it from here. What is the before number? Oh, let me do it. I have it, is it on um, the screen there somewhere. There are one of mental lights that the town owns. 135 correct? before, there's, 50 there's off. There's yeah, different street lights on a mental and stuff that, that, that we do not own. Yeah, but the typical Cobra head. Yeah, but you're yeah. going from 400 to 90. So it should be three quarters savings. So I don't it's 140,000, 134,904. That's what. Is there a reason it's not bigger in proportion to the? I guess maybe you've already s installed some, so those savings have already been realized. This is the no. This is the savings. capacity. This is the, the, this is the okay, total, based on what we have in in in, in the in the. Um, thus far. Thus far. Yeah. I see. So that's kind of. What about down. the yeah. the capital, in, in the, the capital that was missed? Right. So it, it's about a thirty percent savings because of the reduction in kilowatt hour sales. 
We've, we've gone to a formula rate for the, for the municipal street lights where it's our average cost plus our power supply cost. Um, historically what we had was the capital cost of those old street lights yep. weren't included in yep. the old street light rate. I see. Um, and the so when, light rate was down here. Correct. Yeah, I see. Correct. So it wasn't as much of a savings, but it was good that we caught it. No, it's anything not is for good. you, I guess. The new rate does have the capital cost. Correct. In it. Yes, okay. correct. Thank you. Now it makes perfect sense. Yeah. Okay. Um, go ahead, Henry. Okay, and John, this is the new program, basically, that you know it's a, a software program that it's being used by all three parties RMLD, Verizon, and uh, Comcast. Mm -hmm. Basically, it tells you, you know, who. We, who's got what in the, the, the service territory and what they need to do, either they transfer or remove the poles. There's something I need to mention, the, the, the often this question comes up that, you know, who owns the pole? The ownership of poles in all four uh, service territories are 50-50, 50% and 50% RMLT. However, the custodial is at North Reading, it 100% uh, RMLT and Reading, half the Reading is ours. The rest of the communities, you know, it's with Verizon. So Verizon, they're covering more than, oh, you know, okay. RMLT. And then uh, you pay them, they pay you, or is it just a, how does that work? Yes, for the yes that's right. Okay. Yeah, that's all. Does problem. there, um, just, I, I don't mean to interject, mm -hmm. but so what happens with the poll is the custodian mm -hmm. sets the poll. So if we need a poll or we're building a circuit in their custodial area, we call them, they set the poll. And then the the engines is ball and court. So electric transfers, you know, then cable TV, then fire or whatever, it goes yeah. down. So the engine is is telling you you're next to ball and court to make the transfer. Yeah. When everyone's done transferring, the custodial come back and pulls the pull button. And so that's really what the custodian does. So yeah, there's a 605A billing that goes back and forth based on. Right. Thank you. Okay. So based on the current status in the in Reading, Can I guess see the that? double poles. You see that uh, in the town of uh, Reading, we got uh, this is basically the uh, automatic. We got 23 transfers, and we got 27 pole bots that you know, that we need to remove. That's the status. These these numbers, you know, it's like you know they go up and down. They continue sure, to change yes, because we are making improvements throughout the community in, to increase the reliability and improve the operating conditions. Yep. So we've got lots of projects. You're going to see lots of constructions, upgrades, and all of these that you know they're coming up in the next four or five years. And you know, actually, it's a ten-year program, but you know, we've got in the next four or five years, you're going to see lots of other crews. They're going around making improvements and upgrades. So these double poles, you know, we get to them. I really appreciate the uh, our valued customers' uh, patience. Uh, we get to them, but. As they come in, the ones that you know we prioritize, the ones that they pose a possibly a traffic issue or could be a safety uh, problem, we immediately take care of those. But the ones that you know they could go in the queue waiting for transfers and take care of them in a timely manner. Right. Mm -hmm. That's how we prioritize them. So I want you to know and the public to know that we got a good program. We are on top of that. So basically, that's it. If you have any other questions, I'm more than happy to address them. Great. Okay. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you for the update. Great presentation. Okay. Okay. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 2018. Okay. It's not bad. Same. We do. That's a policeman. 51,000 is a policeman. Yeah, it's a good Okay. Hearing time. Here we go. To the inhabitants of the town of Reading, please take notice of the board of selection meeting town of Reading. We'll hold a public hearing on March 7th, 2017 in the Selectman's Room, 16 Lowell Street, Reading, Mass. Stop sign approval on Auburn Street at Auburn Street at Beacon Street at 7.45 p.m. A copy of the proposed documents regarding these topics are available in the town manager's office, 16 Lowell Street, Reading, Mass., Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, 7.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m., Tuesday from 7.30 a.m. to 7 p.m. and are attached to the hearing notice on the website at www.readingma.gov. All interested parties are invited to attend the hearing or may submit their comments in writing or by email prior to 6 p.m. on March 7, 2017 to town manager at ci.reading.ma.us by order of Robert W. Lasher, town manager. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, board. How are we doing tonight? How are we doing, Chief? Well, I'm here as a 
we had several neighbor concerns several months ago brought to the parking traffic transportation task force regarding uh, speeders in uh, after school between 215 and 245 leaving the high school coming around Beacon Street mm -hmm. uh, down Auburn taking a right on Beacon heading down the hill so I've sent several officers up there to monitor it we had speed warp up uh, there at one point we are averaging 100 to 200 cars some days coming through that that intersection area um, and uh, I think one of the neighbors is here tonight well yeah, nice. and uh, over what turn time frame is that 100 200 it's between basically two to three o'clock in the afternoon after, we have, cars after school in an hour? yeah it's oh, a, okay. wow. a lot of time welcome you know. to my world okay. right <laughs> they're all coming that out doesn't count dan you live near the school <laughs> they're all coming out it seems to, be, to go <laughs> any sure direction of town about, but they're trying to avoid i think the intersection down at uh, birch metal drive and they all go that seems to be the way they go out to main street is that direction okay so i actually went up myself and watched it one day and it is a lot of cars <laughs> in that area and quite honestly i'm in support of a uh, stop sign right there at the corner on Auburn at Beacon. Uh, there isn't one right now. now where, where would the sign go on Auburn eastbound or what? It go on Auburn eastbound, correct. Okay. Heading towards. It'd, it'd just be the one sign. Just one sign. Okay. So what is it like a bend right there where you don't have to stop right now? Yeah. Is it so kind of like a exactly. unwritten rule? It, right. It's kind of a sharp bend, but it's kind of like an unwritten rule for years. It's been going on. It was, okay. You know, and finally, I think it should be addressed at this point. You know. But you're only putting the stop sign on Arbor, nothing on Beacon. Nothing on Beacon. Beacon, we have the hill, which, it's so when they, yeah. yeah, it's pretty, when they're coming up, they, we don't see much concern with them taking a left on to mm -hmm. Auburn, like in the mornings. Okay, it's cool. definitely much more in the afternoons leaving the area. I've almost, I, I don't know how they can manage it. So here's what you need to do. you got to tell us who you are. I'm Amy Ward. Okay, Amy. I live, at, I live at Beacon and Auburn. There you go. Yes. Okay. And Ground zero. They come up from Main Street, up Locust Street, turn right onto Beacon, and I don't know how they managed to top speed and almost kill me and my family getting up and rounding that corner, but I don't know how you would put a stop sign there. Right, on the hill. Corner. Yep. But they do do it. There's a morning commute where they try to avoid, and I mean, I think those high school parents have forgotten we have little kids, and they mm -hmm. run out into roads sometimes, mm -hmm. you know? And the high schoolers themselves, literally, don't realize, you know, that little kids don't stop, you know. So we've we had have several. Birch Meadow traffic too, and Coolidge traffic. I mean, we're on the outskirts of well, Birch so, Meadow. But it's a cut through, is what you said. But yes, so we have Birch. I have Birch Meadow kids. But you're describing the problem in the morning going uphill. Morning it's and afternoon. Right. So what we're so talking about here is so. cover both? yeah the problem is we wouldn't be able to mitigate a sign there would really be no place coming up the hill on Beacon to take a left on Auburn we would be stopping like on a snow storm yeah, yeah, yeah it'd yeah, be right around right down no there's no way so they they do come up Auburn to turn on to Beacon though and they don't realize that their Beacon Street continues they almost like kind of just feel like there isn't a Beacon Street there so they just come like flying around <laughs> Like not even a stop. Who's going the reverse of what you just? Yes, described. they okay. do it And so this ways. stop sign will. It's half the problem. It, it, it sounds like the theory is if you acknowledge the stop sign, you stop that. Yes. Would you agree half with that? Half of it. We will stop most of it. Yeah. I I truly believe. I sounds mean, like I, it's it, it's one of those funny places that it may be hard to do more than one, right? I absolutely. Yeah, so I we would have to create a curb, and I mean, there is a. Yeah. I found an intersection in Wakefield in the middle of a residential area with a three-way stop that, like, you would have never, like, you'd be like, oh, that's weird. They must have like the same problem as us with people just flying. Some kid got hit by a car ten years ago, and then they decided. To yes. So they, and then that's our thing. They were like, oh, well, there hasn't been. I'm like, there hasn't been yet because I've leapt into the road to grab my child from getting, you know, run over, but. And now, obviously, with the aggressive enforcement on our end, too, once the stop sign goes up, and in the mornings, I wasn't aware of the mornings, which is a pet problem as well, so we'll, we'll definitely look into that for you yep. as well. Is okay. Beacon going uphill as well, Chief, in that area? Beacon is uphill right in that area. Yeah, that, it's a pretty steep hill in that area, too. Yeah. So you can't stop and never make it? No way, yeah, absolutely not. Chief, when you, um, when you put a new stop sign up, do you, is there sort of a period where you kind of monitor it, maybe put a cruiser out there, yeah, do absolutely, some yeah. warning, because a lot of people aren't used to it and kind of just... Yeah, yeah know, written, well, absolutely. There, it's it's going to be a warning for a few then, weeks, you know, absolutely. Just get people used yep. to the idea that... Yeah, 100%.
I'm right. assuming you probably reach out to the schools too for that kind of announcement. We already did, so I think we did back several months ago reach out to the schools at least to advise the kids as well. Okay. Some some probably take heed to it, some don't. So sure. you know when they get stopped with blue lights, they may. That's take when they get take heed to it. Yeah. You know. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. Sorry. So I'm uh, Bob Connor, I'm a neighbor of Amy, and uh, I think even though the stop sign, I think it's a great idea. And uh, worst case, people will slow down. They see a stop sign. I know wherever I am in the key neighborhood. At least makes me think, okay. You got a fighting chance, huh? I got a <laughs> stop now. Whether I go through it two miles an hour, at least I'm only doing two miles an hour. Right. So I, I agree that this this would be uh, a great help. And uh, they have uh, a young children. He has a new baby and a little girl. And it's a very tight street, as Dan probably knows. And uh, this, I think, would be very helpful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. is, there any, is there any treatment to the turf? The, uh, Turn ratio of that road that would help by preventing kind of the high speed turn. He's also like going up. Yeah, but you see, I, I've got it on Google Maps so you can kind of see it. Um, Steve this, no, not so much that. There's a really healthy um, <laughs> radius joking. turn. There's a really yeah, broad radius turn here. So they can kind of make that turn at relatively high speed. If you made that more square. I get, yeah, I guess I could speak with engineering, see what they have, you know. Kind of see how it's kind of a radius turn. You can kind of do that at high speed, right? In Dale, yeah, yeah, it does look a little bit like Yeah, but it might it, it force you to slow down just out of mm -hmm. safety. Oh, yeah. yeah, you're almost you know, taking the feather it this way. Okay, well, I'll leave it to engineering. It's just right now, they've already it's got race tracks on it. You can see it. Right, uh, right. I think we're in agreement. Yeah, it sounds like you want it. The neighbors want it. Where do we got to go from here? Let's Don't bring her. Raise your hands. <laughs> yeah, Seems like that's what we got to do. Yeah, should, uh, 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 just double yeah. check on uh, public comment. Full yeah, is there any other public comment? Uh, yes, please. Mike Lacey, I live at Beacon Street. And What's your name? name? What's your name, please? Mike, Mike Lacey. Lacey. Mike Lacey, okay. And you looked at 9 Beacon Street for the past four years, and certain as the sun. Yeah. When the high school kids come and go. There was one time I actually contacted Dave, Officer Savio, where the straw that broke the camel's back. My wife was getting my daughter into into the car, driving daycare, and there was a black SUV that came probably two feet screeching around. So I'm like, you know, it's it's one thing. We were all teenagers. I mean, I wouldn't be coming up here talking to you guys, requesting this if I didn't have young kids, but we do. There are a lot of young kids in the neighborhood, and it is a problem. It's, anyway. That's a fact. But thank you very much for your time. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Thanks for coming in. Uh, move to close the hearing on the stop sign on Auburn Street at Beacon Street. Yes. Second. We're doing that. Yeah, we're yeah, doing that now. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor? Okay, here he's closed. Here right. we go. Move that the Board of Selectmen approve the placement of an isolated stop sign on Auburn Street at Beacon Street. Uh, can I add the words that Auburn Street eastbound, so there's no ambiguity there? Street eastbound. Take that as a friendly amendment. Yeah. Sure. Is there anything we need to do, Bob, to for the engineering component of this? Or is that. Dutch, you got to address that and stuff, too. All right. Need a second? Second. All Any discussion? All those in favor? Okay, we've got a 5 over there. Thanks. Um, Thank you. Good to go. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Have a night. Thank you. Thanks for everybody's patience. Yeah. I know we're yeah. running a little behind here. Could you just take two or three minutes? Right. Yeah, Certainly. Sure. So we'll take a very brief recess and be back in a minute.
the inhabitants of the town of Reading, please take notice that the Board of Selectmen of the town of Reading will hold a public hearing on March 7, 2017, in the Selectmen's Meeting Room, 16 Low Street, Reading, Mass, on water, sewer, and stormwater rates for FY18 at 8 p.m. Uh, a copy of the proposed documents regarding these topics are available in the town manager's office, 16 Low Street, Reading, Mass, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday from 7.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m., Tuesday from 7.30 a.m. to 7 p.m. and are attached to the hearing notice on the website <coughs> at www.reading.ma.gov. All interested parties are invited to attend the hearing or may submit their comments in writing or by email prior to 6 p.m. on March 7, 2017 to town manager at ci.reading.ma.us by order of Robert W. Lasher, town manager. Thank you. This is the same presentation you've seen every year for quite a while. Mm -hmm. There's four factors that come into play on setting rates. The first two are budget items. The last two are other things. In terms of local costs, um, we do a pretty good job uh, managing our local costs. We have some control over that. You can see over this five-year time period, our local costs are about 1.5% annually, combined water and sewer. Um, mostly that comes through capital planning, which we have some flexibility to do. Uh, but there is you know, capital you have to do, and we can't just skip it. What gives rise to the re reduction in sewer? capital is it just we're way ahead of it on sewer if if we finish something and then don't do something for a year their projects are bigger sometimes we skip years so it goes up and down a little That's more uh, MWRA's costs are a little bit higher but not out of sight uh, five percent on water three percent on sewer on the over the same five-year period um, you know you can sort of see visually uh, water next year is higher than sewer in terms of a jump but again 3.7 percent this is about 50 percent of our budget is MWRA three quarters in sewer, one quarter in water? You know when the uh, Deer Island uh, debt service drops out? It's, it's still in the future. Soon. I think it's like almost done, isn't it? Um, is it 30 I think it's in the 20s somewhere, 2020s. I don't know when. <laughs> they rescheduled some of it and pushed some forward. I don't know if it's Deer Island. And, and just how much debt will the sewer component roughly drop? You know, I don't. I don't know that. Yeah. I, I don't know that. Um, their their forecast beyond this year, roughly for sewer, is is higher than water their increases so mm -hmm. that'll hurt us more <clears throat> other factors um, conservation I was interested in some of our MLD's discussion I am suggesting a very slight tweak um, just to stay ahead of the conservation efforts which is worth a little less than a percent on the rates um, here's you know she was saying their usage is about flat that's incredible look at, that, look at that, water that's wow. just, it's down from 780,000 down to 635,000 at a time when the community is growing. Yeah. Yeah, there are more I mean, houses, there are yeah. some more businesses. So, you know, I can understand why power demand is flat, but this is pretty astonishing. That's a 20% decrease in 10 years. We just had a pretty good drought this past summer, too. Well, it's probably yeah. not that surprising. All your home appliances are energy efficient. I mean, though, until recently, the, to the toilets have, have been huge. Light bulbs are light bulbs, right? Yeah, yeah, let me, let me yeah, show you something else which I thought was pretty interesting. The biggest component there, right? Water here. <laughs> Uh, Let's see if I can find the summary here. Here it is. Yeah, that doesn't get much um, water. Reading is one of the lowest communities in the state for unaccounted for water, 1.13%. Does that mean our pipes are good? That's a yeah, that means we're doing a really good yeah. job with infrastructure. Um, this is non-billable water that's just paid for and wasted. Um, the acceptable guidelines from the MWRA are between 5 and 10%. And so what is, so that's an interesting thing for people who might yeah. be watching this to understand in real dollars. Yeah. You know, because when people get a little bit um, upset about the fact that, you know, the streets are torn up and the, you know, our infrastructure is up to date. Yes. Well, and it's better It's better than other so towns, yes. certainly. Um, and when I say up to date, I mean yeah. we are working. We have a program. Right. Yep. So in real dollars, the delta between a 1%, 1.13 and a 10%, what is that in, in money? That would only affect the MWR part, right? Um, yeah, we're... Well, assuming it would. Well, they passed that lost stuff up for us anyway, so we were paying for it. You just have to look at it. Yeah, we're yeah. avoiding maybe a hundred plus grand a year in charges. That's material. Yeah, I mean, you know, in the long run, we're spending less on capital than we would be by just throwing it out the window. And astonishingly, some of the numbers of some of the communities that I'm aware of, you know, these figures are as high as 15 and 25 percent. You know, some, for water. sometimes yeah. it's really important for people to understand that, you know, good capital planning, good infrastructure planning is all part of what goes into good budget planning because yep. that's an, that pays, you know, a, a young, a new police officer. 
Yeah. You know, I mean, you got to think about it that way. Um, well, the legal taps would show up here as well. Right? I'm sorry, say again. In a legal tap that bypassed the meeting. Yes, that they would. would they would. Well. Yep. So other towns may have a little bit of problem. And I, I don't know how you can get lower than this if we, you know, unless we stop flushing the water mains once a year. So there's yeah. going to always well, be some. That comes out of this. Yeah, that comes absolutely. Right. Yeah. This and is this, the first time you've ever showed this. Statistic. Yeah, we just never thought to show it, and, and it's really it's been getting a little better every year. But this is the lowest that I ever remember seeing it. And this number here, it's a little small, but Reading is 25 percent below average in residential usage of water. The average household uses 25 percent less. Now, if you can show the unaccounted sewer, I'll give you a start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's not go. So there. I mean, does it? I don't know. Maybe this is a state mandate, but you know. Does it make sense to, to relieve the water ban? We can't. It's not really. It's not our choice. Forced, you know, Is that the state that wouldn't let us? Requires it. Yeah. yeah, you're required to keep that. Yeah. The statewide water ban. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah. It's not really enforced. It's it's part of our consent order with the DEP to continue to do that and the, the do more uh, on, on for just for, for reading or or just for, for reading yeah. specifically for reading to join the MWRA in perpetuity. They said we have to have a water ban. Yes. So. Okay, we got one. Yep. Next. Um, uh, collections, no problems this year, uh, aside from the fact we don't have a treasurer collector, which comes up <laughs> later in the night. Um, we have very healthy water reserves. Some of that was because we had capital projects planned and canceled, much like we've seen yes. in the general fund. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to suggest um, using a little less reserves in water instead of 800 or 500 in sewer, instead of using zero, using 450. Mm -hmm. um, if you didn't use any reserves, combined rates would go up 12 percent. Remember, we used 800,000 last year. Mm -hmm. That's why. Uh, if you use the reserves I'm outlining, it's 4.2 percent. Um, this gives you a history, a re recent history of water and sewer rates, and this gives you a longer-term history in terms of the graph. With this being a somewhat, art well, a very artificial number because rates went down when we get rid of the discount. So really, this number is a plus three percent really year. Didn't. Right, but the message generally is, you know, we had some high r high years while we joined the MWA for sure. When did we join them? We had uh, right around here. Six. Yeah. yeah. This was a one-time usage adjustment that was a big one that some of you had to make. Otherwise, generally speaking, after the first three year, rates have been uh, three to five percent, which is the best we could have ever hoped when we joined the MWA. Yeah, we we we, 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 we were thinking eight. eight. We for, yeah, we did eight. Yeah. Right. What would it take in reserves to get it down to say sub two four percent? Uh, every hundred thousand you use knocks off eight tenths of a percent, so not much. You could do it. Let me just show you a little bit looking ahead. Um, if we use on average this amount every year, you're still going to be looking at just under 5%. The 4.2 is a little low, and part of it's that usage adjustment. It would be 3.4 otherwise. Um, there's never a good answer. The MWA's forecast is usually a percent high. We know that, but we still can't pretend otherwise. But our forecast originally was eight. So this, yeah, and so if they're forecasting, if they're half, <coughs> half this number, yes. 74 and 34, close enough, uh, and they're a percent high. Half a percent. Yeah, exactly. So we're back, back down to the 4.2 area. Other than um, uh, canceled capital projects, um, I understand how we generate free cash. How do we yeah. generate reserves of Sell water? more water. Everybody should use water. But we're not, but we're selling less water. <laughs> so we're, we're growing reserves and we're selling less water. How Don't well, fix that tap. <laughs> um, right here, where is it? Maybe I, there it is. Um, this is a year to date figure. Um, we're actually seeing higher usage this year for the first time in a while. But I'm not willing to concede that it's permanent. I think it probably is because of new development. Yeah, if you just look work. around at the houses. projects, we have right. more houses. Yeah. Right. Right. If you look at some of the Johnson pipelines. Johnson Woods gets closer yeah. to completion, you know, yeah. Reading Woods. Um, you know, the place down at the train depots, another 75 users or whatever, yeah. 65. I mean, I see uh, Facebook yeah. posts, people bemoaning the fact that we're having development and the infrastructure will not support them. Is that categorically uh, false? That is categorically yeah. false. Right. Except we can uh, sell a lot more water. Yeah, the pipes are there, and we have fixed costs. So, right. yeah, half our costs are fixed costs. So, no, we're, we're in. I mean, you know, some of the discussions with our peers. Our infrastructure is in great shape by comparison to anyone, honestly. 
Um, we can support economic development, we just don't have the land. <laughs> So that's really it in a nutshell on water and sewer, you know, four plus percent rates um, at $10 and 17 cents uh, each. And then just really fast storm water. Um, we have one more year of not doing much in terms of changing rates. But um, I'm going to suggest that this board uh, in the summer or perhaps early fall, sit down and really have a meeting with DPW in here and talk about storm water. Maybe conservation should come in as well, and the public, and just talk about the philosophy of what the storm water fund was set up for, what it should do, what it shouldn't do. Um, we have um, a much clearer, well, a clearer, I shouldn't say much clearer picture on the NIPTI's uh, federal regulations. Um, we still don't know exactly dollars what that will cost, but we have a, an idea. Our town engineer can speak to that. Um, the big wild card, almost 10 years ago, there was some uh, large river cleanup projects put in this fund as a planning tool. I don't know if anyone ever really thought they were going to be done, but we really should have a discussion and either address them or drop them, I think. Or, or say we can't do it for 10 years and let's push it out. But that discussion needs to happen. Um, but This is more of tying things together. Yeah, sure. ignoring the river projects, I don't think you can hold the fee at $40 if you are going to do the drainage projects that is required. I mean, people are, you know, on occasion, single-family homes are being flooded. And I yeah. think the town has some responsibility to yes. take care of their drainage. So is it's a philosophical is question. A lot? Um, it's a relative term, but yeah, I mean, we've identified, we have money every year to spend a hundred grand for smaller things. Uh, last year, this year, and forecast for next year, there's a couple of bigger projects that cost more than that, that are specifically put in. Um, and there will be one more set. You see here three drainage projects, one and three quarters million. Um, you actually undertake that in this fund, you're going to have to raise it to 60 from 40, yeah. for instance. Um, but it's, it's a discussion that's probably worth having. In my opinion, it's our responsibility whether you charge it through this fund or put it back in the general fund is, is a different discussion. Obviously, there's not a lot of room in the general fund, but nonetheless. Um, the three projects are not the rivers. No. no, they're just local streets. I could give you. They're probably in the capital plan. I know they are. Yep. I just don't have them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with this real residents impacted, they they need some help. That's definitely happened. I mean, people, to do that. They, yeah. We're seeing people in the last month that that's happened. To. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, you look at a map and wherever there is one, Reading's wet. You know, there's yeah. a lot of a lot of water in this town, and some of it causes drainage problems. So. Yep. So that's it in a nutshell. So um, if you're in agreement, you don't have to set rates tonight, but I don't really see any uncertainty. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't use less reserves than I asked for so that I wouldn't have an increase higher than 4.2 because there's ample reserves. Mm -hmm. If you want to knock more off, you can use more reserves. It's not a big problem. So 100 k gets you eight tenths. So yeah, 50. I'd go 50 in each would knock off four tenths in each and I, I can actually do the math I have a spreadsheet yeah so that would bring them under three we did a three I yeah that, I, you know that seems to see. me if we're not going to endanger our reserves Bob they're already no. healthy sure now, the problem with I, that I is you're going to have a spike next year back but. well it, it gets harder in the future but you know here's uh -huh. here's a picture you can sort of do the math in your head can you make that bigger oh yeah do it in your head if you could see it <laughs> um, I ran 50 as outliers. Mm -hmm. This one's a little smaller. Um, cost you 250,000 to knock it down to one percent. Yeah, that doesn't seem like it's a good idea. I guess is if I do. Uh, Did that update? No, it doesn't. I have to. I make sure I do it by hand. Don't ask me why. Whoops, wrong. <laughs> Got to do the right field though so that knock you know 100,000 there knocks knocks this five and a half under you're already under on sewer if that's what you're interested in there'd be, fine, be no problem using 600 and 450 I'd be okay with that. that would do combined rates let's see 964 I'm inclined to think that that's a good thing to do yeah that's yeah. certainly fine oh, 10 yeah absolutely 
so we have the slide right the numbers right in the, I mean that gets you down to under three and a half combined it's so. 1001 and 1017 yeah I think so let's go back and look Water and yeah 1001 and 1017 Does it make sense to kind of maybe keep things the same this year with an idea of lowering it next <coughs> year especially if we're going to have maybe an override discussion so that you know we're not going down this year then to have the water and so we'll go up I, I, why I, we're doing it over don't forget they, they've gone up six percent because yeah. the i'm typically so. opposed to making a deal that way i mean well, you know my my inclination is as follows that, this is a user's fee this isn't a, you know i mean yeah, but it still it comes out of the same pocket the, the, you, know. you missed my point uh, a big pushback on the override came with the fact that the average residential rate went up six percent on account of the library yeah. kicking in fully this correct year. So let's give them some relief in this. No, I, I'm not. And I agree saying. with that because I, you know, that's that is what I have heard, particularly over the last several months, is that much of the pushback was tied to the fact that, well, you know, they knew that the rest of the library was coming in, and they it was voted for, and that was fine. Right. Um, but between their normal two and a half tax increase, their their valuations, their full library you know expense if we can give them a break here I, you know i think we should it just seen it you know, and, and they, healthy. This, this is the time to do it and there was a lot of people that complained last year of the of the water rates right. i certainly heard well, it's the, the sewer water. rate that yeah. you know drives me crazy and i, and I understand that mm -hmm. so what would the water rate and sewer rate be at this report um ten or one ten dollars and one cent you could make it ten dollars right. and ten dollars and seventeen cents on sewer and what are the minimum Quarterly bills. Uh, double those, so it's and those would represent what kind of an increase? Uh, Three point eight on water. Oh, let's just use ten dollars. I can't stand a penny. Right. <laughs> yeah. There, so three point seven percent on water, and uh, just under three percent, two point nine on sewer. Can we do? Can we use some more reserves on sewer too? Good. I'd be a little more cautious with sewer because MWA forecasts their sewer right. going up, and that's three quarters of our bill. So I'd want to be a little we more careful. Yeah. No, I, at some point, the, the debt service in water, and it's still five or more years out, is going to chop 25% off water rates. And that's something that you know we've been in the middle of yeah. trying to negotiate. Yeah, anyway. Something that's important. Here, so in five, right. so in five years, our our uh, water bills go down because we, our we debt drop the, the, the drop away. we drop the debt service. You, uh, and that will coincide the roughly with the schools of the library? No. It's Sorry. close. Yeah, it is close. I Not forget quite. exactly. I don't have a We're eight yeah. years out on the yeah. school. Yeah. So, be, so, well, seven now, right? It's, it's within a couple of years. I just don't so remember. So it's close. It's close. Okay. And, and the MDA has got two points. One is the partial buy and one's the full, but close enough. Okay. And um, in water, I shouldn't say this, but... You know, once you fully fund punchings, you go to OPEC. The water, we bought in, we bought in. That's right. It. You know, there's always uh, infrastructure, but so I think I think you're fine, absolutely fine, and knocking water down a little bit more. I'd be a little more cautious on sewer. I'm sorry. Well, I think by doing this, we we show them a, a responsible. <clears throat> reduced increase if that even makes sense yeah and, and you are seeing economic development at the margins at the very least so yeah. right we should be selling more water right. without a doubt in the next couple of years or at least it's gonna uh, keep those up. projects at least it'll stop yeah. going down yeah for those a while projects right. are coming to fruition they're yeah. not all done what sounds that sounds like a caption right there what's the selecting minimum? lower water rate just saying i have a suggestion <laughs> to sell more water <laughs> I have a suggestion to sell more water in a moment, but first, what is the minimum quarterly bill for these two? It's double, so $20 and, uh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, $20 and $20.34. $28. What was the second one? $20.34. $20.34. $20. Yeah. Oh, so that's just sort of by, by, uh, and 40 on the stormwater? Yes, sorry, $40 on yeah. the stormwater. Okay. So $10, 10 dollars ten seventeen. anything else? Me either. Uh, motion closing here. Al. <laughs> 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 Any comment? Got anything for us, Al? What's the uh, final percentage? Uh, three point three percent combined. Uh, so move that the board of selectmen close the hearing on setting the water and sewer storm water Second. rates for FY18. Good discussion. All in favor? Okay. Move that the. 
Move to set the FY 2018 <coughs> water rate at $10 per 100 cubic feet with a minimum quarterly, quarterly bill of $20, effective with the December 2017 billing. Do I want to do these all at yeah, one time? Yeah, okay. sure. Move to set the FY 2018 sewer rate at $10.17 per 100 cubic feet with a minimum quarterly bill of $20.34, mm -hmm. effective with the December 2017 billing. And move to set the storm water rate at $40 per unit um, 3,210 square feet per year to be billed quarterly effectively with the December 2017 bill. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? 5 0. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Um, this being the subject of water, I wanted to bring up an idea for more consumption. Um, a few of my folks in my precinct have raised the issue of um, double meters for use in sprinkling their lawn. A deduct meter. And uh, in the past, this board, when I first joined the board, the then chair took a dim view on this, largely because it would use more water. And it seems to me that we're perversely arguing the opposite here. We actually want to sell more water. But the thought of a deduct meter would let folks that want to water their lawn pay the component of cost for the water side. But no sewer. And not be burdened with the value of the sewer uh, assessment, for which obviously there is none. So it's not only consuming more water, it's more representative of what's going on. I don't know the specifics, Bob, and how it would work with DPW. We can work out the mechanics and the cost thing and the rating and all that later. But I wanted to see if this board would entertain or what it would take to reinstantiate the use of deduct meters for those taxpayers, homeowners that are interested in doing it. It's something I do here on a regular basis. I look in it, but remember that there's going to be an offsetting increase in sewer rates mm -hmm. to make up for the loss. Right water volume that you're no longer billing on the sewer side. Right. True, but you'll have an increased use on this water side. I understand Man. sewer is the bigger yeah. part of it, so you're still probably... I'm, I'm willing to see some modeling done on that. Uh, um, yeah, Dan's right. We can certainly bring in some staff and some data, some surveys. We, we surveyed peer communities maybe five years ago. You know, we could do it again. Um, there's other topics that <coughs> can be discussed. I don't know if they, it sells more water, but there are some communities that tier rates. Um, they, this communities with three tiers is increasing the most or decreasing as you use. So it, as you use more, it costs more. Oh. Again, not less conservation, which again is kind of odd. We're not yeah. trying to do that. Well, it also penalizes users of the biggest amount of water, which are usually commercial in some yeah. of these communities. Yeah. Right. Winchester is the best example with hospital. Yeah. Yeah, they've so, got to be using. You know, I'm not inclined to want to. Yeah. But there's sure. lots of options you could right. throw on the table if you wanted to have a discussion. How would that how would that uh, fly with the state ban on uh, on water? You know, how would what fly? Having to, you know dual metering, where basically well, I know the ban is only restricting hours of, of yeah. operation. It doesn't say you cannot have it. You still can't control. use it during that hour. Right. But if right. you do, you're paying only for the water component. Yeah, I, I, it's an open question as to whether you would or wouldn't sell more water. I don't know. At I, the margin, I you may. I would sell less. Right. I would agree with that. Yeah. So it can't hurt. Mm -hmm. And it's more representative for the homeowner. Yeah, we, we'll have schedule a night with DPW and have them tell you from their perspective whatever the pluses or minuses are. So yeah. I don't think it's a big number. Too, right? uh, so, so a capital yeah, cost too, right? It's going to be a capital cost of doing the meters. And, right. Or, yeah. or, or, or customer retro, pays, you know, retrofitting the customer system. pays for that. There'd be a fee. It's, it's cost neutral to the <laughs> uh, Would the billing system have to change because they're, they're going to shoot the meters from the street? Mm -hmm. I would think so. Yeah. Yeah, so that's why you just need to have a costs. chat about yeah, it. Yeah, the implementation is important. You know, the right time to discuss it is six months before tonight, so you know, we'll do it in the next six months. And it might take a couple discussions. Right, yes, we did bring this up a couple Just let, it, let me know when that's going to pop up. Okay. That'd be helpful. Yep. Thank you. Very good. Next. So we can get that on an agenda item someplace. Okay, sure. You're on. All right. Okay. To the inhabitants of the town of Reading, please take notice that the Board of Selectmen, the town of Reading, will hold a public hearing on March 7, 2017, and the Selectmen's Meeting room 16 Lowell Street, Reading, Mass. On amending the FY17 non-union classification plan at 8:30 p.m. Copy of the proposed documents regarding these topics are available in the town manager's office, 16 Lowell Street, Reading, Mass. Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, 7:30 to 5:30 p.m. Tuesday from 7:30 a.m. to 7 p.m. And are attached to the hearing notice on the website at www.readingma.gov. All interested parties are invited to attend the hearing or may submit their comments in writing or by email prior to 6 p.m. on March 7, 2017 to town manager at ci.reading.ma.us by order of Robert W. 
the last year town manager. Okay, thank you. I just want to read from a memo I put in your packet last week, just so I don't forget. Um, as, as many or all of you know, our treasurer collector uh, resigned after a long career here to go to another community. Um, her last day was last Thursday. <clears throat> um, anytime this change, especially in a long held position, it's time to look at it. We only had a couple weeks to think about it, but <clears throat> you know, we did, Sharon and I did spend a lot of time thinking about it. And um, we listed below four things that we thought were important in a transition. Uh, the first was to create an assistant department head position, which this position that Nancy's leaving was, that has more opportunity to be involved and basically help Sharon as a department yep. head. Nancy was very busy, did not have the time. And that's two-pronged. That's finance, but it's also management. It's HR. Uh, both those things are important uh, in managing any department. Um, our finance department, like other departments, are not exactly deep. So one way we combat that is have a lot of cross-trained people. So you'll see people that work in the collector's office that also work for the town clerk, and they rotate on a schedule. We think it's important to continue to have cross-training any time there's an absence. That means a function can continue. <clears throat> we like the idea of creating growth opportunities for current staff when we can. And I thought it was not a bad idea to try to stay within the budget that's in FinCom's lap. So those are sort of the four parameters. <clears throat> um, the, the model that we came up with that I'll just show you visually, I've highlighted with these colors behind me in uh, green or yellow, the finance department positions. There are also clerical positions that I have not listed. Uh, but you can see that Right now, we have a treasurer collector position in this grade right here that's crossed out. We also have an assessor. Now, our assessor, assessor is shared with Wakefield, so he's not paid on this chart. If we hired one, this is where we would pay him. This is where the department head is. Um, and then our three assistant positions have been in this grade down here in F. What I'm requesting is to eliminate this treasurer collector position, and I'll get back to that to in insert in its place a treasurer slash assistant finance director to do the things I just mentioned. Yeah. Uh, to create a collector's position from scratch, that's, that's the other half of the job, if you will, and then to uh, increase the assistant treasurer position one grade from F to G because the treasurer will be doing other things other than treasury things to help Sharon manage her department and do finance. And so you need this person So we need this person to step in and fill a little bit more on the on the finance on the treasury side um, although yeah, I'm good at math this appears to be creating a job it isn't yeah. as I mentioned there's clerical pe people in the department we know what our budget is um, you know we have to first get your permission then advertise positions but there is a natural order of, of promotions that could occur if the people are interested in the positions and at the end of the day we would eliminate one of the clerical positions to make this all balance um, also, we have a retirement of our current assistant collector next July. So there's a lot of turnover. We just had our long-term uh, assistant treasurer uh, retire uh, la late last fall. Right. So the three top positions below Sharon in the department have all changed or will change in a short period of time. Um, as, as you saw earlier tonight, one of the mo more important things we do in Treasury is keep the light department working. <laughs> you know, they buy power frequently. We have to use the Fed wire to do that. There's not a lot of margin of error there when you're buying power. So our, our role of our treasurer is different than many communities that don't have light departments. She's got a lot more responsibility. Uh, in point of fact, our current or former treasurer collector was spending decreasing amounts on the collection side every year to the point of very little when she left. Our assistant collector's basically been running that side. So I think operationally this will give Sharon a bit of a hand. I don't well, really we know that that's necessary. And, we, and that's really important. I don't really see any downside to it. Um, we're spreading out and giving opportunity generally to people if they want to apply for it. You know, they'll have to earn it. Um, well, you're not taking anything away from anybody by rearranging No, we're, this. we're really not. Um, you're actually creating opportunities. We're creating opportunity. opportunities for people. Generally, people are, you know, appreciative of that. Um, we are putting up a few more barriers. When you think of finance, you have assessor, you have accounting, and then you have other. And the other in this case, case is treasury and collections. 
while they're all financial functions and belong in the same department, um, you know, you'll know the term from uh, Wall Street and others, it's important to keep Chinese walls between all of those areas. It's very important that the assessor be independent of the treasurer and the collector and the town accountant. It's very important for the town accountant to be very, very independent of any of the rest. Certainly. All those things need to stay apart. Right. The one thing where we've sort of allowed, if you will, a bit of a close relationship is by having a treasurer collector. There's a little bit of a, a gap in there that we haven't had, and it's okay. It's a little better when you have some separation. And our charter calls it allows and, us. And to I, that's that. Thanks, Barry. That's the last thing I wanted to mention is just just by happenstance a couple of years ago in the charter review commission or committee. Um, I did ask them to separate it just in case we ever thought this would be a good idea. I really had no concept at the time we'd actually need it. Uh, but the charter uh, does now address each and allows me to request of you to combine them, which I did as soon as the charter um, was passed. And now I would need to ask you to uncombine these positions uh, effectively and go back to the way the charter is written as a default, where there's a treasurer and there's a collector. And in terms of sort of other peer communities, there's, there's both models. Um, Reading will be a little bit unusual for our size in having a treasurer, a collector, an assistant treasurer, and an assistant collector. Um, but I think, again, with the light department, that's easily justified. And other people use other titles. Some, some towns have a treasurer, a collector, and then one person that's assistant for both. I think it's vital that each of those roles has a real backup. We kicked around a lot of models, and if the treasurer is not in, you can't tell the light department, I'm sorry, you can't buy power this week. <laughs> you just can't. Um, the treasurer is also a key role in payroll. And with the schools, the town, and the light department, that's a huge amount of work, too. And then, obviously, with the collectors, you know, they're collecting water, sewer, and light as well. So there's a volume of work that goes on in our finance department that is higher than our population might otherwise suggest. So, Bob, other than the fact that you wanted to keep the budget relatively the same you know, to what you had at FinCom, um, you know, it, 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 is it, are you adding more stress to the folks in there, especially since it's all relatively new people, new functions or shared functions by having one less, um, assi you know, one less um, assistant? Getting rid of the <coughs> it's the same amount of people, so from that sense, no. It's um, but spreading. The help that they would get sort of from that administrative assistant. You no, know, the assistant collector. The duties will change. Um, there, again, to be real simple, there's an assistant collector now that does a lot of collector's duties. If she's interested and applies and gets the collector's job, all right, fine. Her job won't change a lot. One of the clerical people could then apply for the assistant collector's job. So but people's paychecks could change. Right. Well, yeah, not much, but yeah. Yeah, well, um, so, of their so the depth is still good, the overlap is still good. Um, I, I really, I try to think. I mean, every plan has upside and downside. I, I really couldn't think of a lot of downside, other than people aren't interested in promotions and don't apply, and then <laughs> then you got a bit of a pickle on your hands. And I could only have a limited discussion with staff because I really it's not appropriate to do that before the board has had a, a chance to discuss it. But Sharon and I kicked around all the possibilities, and again, there's another retirement coming up. And uh, this seems like a good plan. And I'll be the first to tell you, if, if a couple years down the road it hasn't worked, I'll let you know why. Uh, but it does seem like with the people we have and the opportunities we have, it, it's, it's a good plan. I will say that, to me, the key of this is uh, who steps into this new number two role, the treasurer or assistant finance director. Because to me, the emphasis is on that second part of the title from now on. So is that a different skill set that you're going to advertise for? Yeah. I mean, kind of? Someone who was maybe a, someone who's an aspiring Sharon, maybe you know someone who's. They, they certainly wouldn't have to be an accountant. They don't have to be it a wouldn't CPA hurt. for that no, job. No, it, it would, they wouldn't have to. But finance background, I mean, a strong finance, finance background is really what you're looking for. Yeah, uh, to, to again to be real simple, Sharon will enjoy this because we discussed this with Dr. Dory at breakfast. I said, uh, well, the least creative person at the table is Sharon, and she said, I couldn't agree more. Accountants don't like to be known as creative. We need a creative person in this job, someone who's financially adept, but very, they come to any one of us and say, you know, you're doing this, you should be doing that. I think an experienced person is what you're looking for. Yes. Right? Yeah. Um, and I think the help that this person could give the whole organization, all of our department heads, 
need to be self-sufficient in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. um, and finance is probably the corporate weakness in our departments. If you think of all the people in place, they're good at a lot of things. We didn't hire finance people to be department heads and assistant department heads Logically except for Sharon. Logically speaking, municipals, the municipal, right. municipalities don't do that. That's a private sector thing generally, yeah. so yeah. And you have to plan for when I'm not here as town manager, the next town manager has to be financially savvy, probably will be not at my level, frankly. Um, I do a lot of stuff the finance department could do and should do and will do some, at some point. So that's why you need a good person there. And it's not necessarily someone who grows in to become the town accountant. Maybe, but maybe not. So, and it does, it stays within the, within you the budget. You want to be in the town accountant. <coughs> Don't you think? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Go. And this person in this job is not necessarily a CPA. Right. Probably isn't, actually. In some ways, I don't <laughs> say that with all respect to Sharon. Yeah. Yeah, I said uh, we wanted someone a little more creative than you, Sharon. She said creativity is not a good thing in an accountant. No, that's good. <laughs> Absolutely. Said the board of directors. <laughs> so that's that's my story. I'm sticking to it. All right. um, for motions, I think Paul has written them all down. Yeah. I'm not sure, Paul, if I asked you to have, uh, let me just read to you what the charter says. Uh, the Board of Selectmen, upon the recommendation of the town manager, may combine the powers and duties of the town treasurer with those of the town collector. <coughs> the manager may then appoint a town treasurer collector. So I guess I would add a motion to uh, separate the town treasurer collector back to town treasurer and town collector upon the request of the town manager. Do you have motion. such a motion there, Barry? No. No, but I, um, maybe we should just do these motions and yeah. then do that one last? Yeah, I could do that last. Okay. okay. Uh, we'll first move to close the hearing amending the FY17 <coughs> non union classification plan. Second. Second. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Okay, move that the Board of Selectmen approve the amendments to the FY17 non union classification plan as follows. One, eliminate the grade J treasurer collector position. Two, create a treasurer assistant finance director position in grade J. Three, upgrade the assistant treasurer position from grade F to grade J. And four, create a collector position at grade I. And what's your motion? Oh, what's the, uh, I gotta hear that last one. Yeah. Be number five. D. Assistant treasurer should go to F to G, not J. Oh, I missed that. Uh, That's a uh, number three. Yeah. Uh, gee. Did I read it wrong? Was it? No, you read it, no, right. You read it right. right. I didn't proofread okay. it well. <laughs> Are the others okay? Yeah. Okay. And what's your one? Uh, hang on. Collector. Let me just check something. That's that sounds right. Collector and I. Yeah, I think I gave the wrong picture, but let me just look. Yeah, eyes right. Those are right. So G is the only correction. Are we, are you going to add to this, Bob, or are you going to make the motion? Um, the other motion, why don't you do these separate? Yeah, okay. Just so. okay. Yeah. Any discussion? No. All those in favor? Um, I, I'll read a motion. The Board of Selectmen, upon the request of the town manager, um, move to separate the functions of town treasurer and town collector. Um, so do we have a motion to that effect? So think, moved. Yeah, I don't think Bob can make that motion. He's really second. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Five vote. Okay, thank you. I'll let you know how it goes. Okay. Oh boy. Out of the warrant. Um, you want me to speed through all the articles and you tell me when to stop and what to skip? Sure. Yep. Article 4, um, you can see there's 
This is in your weekend packet. I didn't bother having it for tonight. And we're moving a lot of capital around. That come from you, Bob. Yeah, generally we're Thank reducing. Uh, Paula sent it on uh, Thursday. Caitlin or Caitlin, on Caitlin right? That's right, Caitlin did. <clears throat> we're generally reducing the amount of capital in our capital plan because of the high school litigation settlement. We had to make some room for that debt. Um, and also, there's an item that was kind of a gray area, so I, no, I actually called it gray area. I put it in words. Um, we own a Metro Fire a trailer. It's a trailer that kids learn fire safety yep. by crawling through it. Um, we didn't pay for it, but it, we actually legally own it and insure it, and so it's ours. So Metro Fire wants to replace the old one and give us a new one, and they get money with a grant. Again, we have no financial role in that. But it seemed important to mention to town meeting, since it's not really in the capital plan, that someone is acquiring a capital asset in our name on our behalf. So I just mentioned it in words. Sharon had, had not really come across this and didn't know how to address it, but it, it didn't seem right to put it in our capital plan with a number on it because right. it's not our money. But isn't it an asset? It is an asset, but we can't sell it. But it's got a kind of value. It's got a value. We have to insure it. Uh, Metrofire gives us a nominal amount each year to maintain it, to you know, do repairs and maintenance on it. If it's a big repair, they, they do it. But someone had to legally own it, so Redding owns this one. So where will you hang it in our records so that it shows up next year and it's not in the discussion? Um, she insures it. That's all you have to really do. It's, it doesn't okay. have to right. exist otherwise. Right. In a later article, you'll see we're going to declare the, other, the old one a surplus, so another town on the South Shore can have it. Camping trailer. Um, yeah, nothing really going on in water. Sewer, they did run into uh, some groundwater in a sewer station project over at West Street and Batchelder. Uh, they don't think they need 200000 but seem like a safe number to ask for. Um, these sewer stations are not cheap to do. Uh, they were originally forecast around half a million, uh, depending on the size and, and location. They've crept up to closer to three-quarters of a million over time. Um, nothing in storm water. Uh, for this current year, next year they are splitting a vacuum truck for two hundred thousand with the uh, sewer enterprise fund. <clears throat> Article five is moving money around in the current fiscal year, and I'll just jump to the bottom. There's a lot of moving parts. Um, assuming the schools want to go ahead with the hundred and fifty thousand of curriculum, and I've not heard that they don't, but I also don't think that they voted on it. Um, we'll be using one hundred seventy-three thousand of free cash. Did they make the additional request of the? income also they're meeting with them on the 15th to discuss their budget so I don't know gray area um, there's also a number in here a hundred thousand dollars of overage on snow and ice who knows what it will be by the time town meeting meets but that's about what it is right now what is well, the overage a uh, hundred thousand on snow and ice Wait, we're a hundred thousand over our yep. budget and it has hardly snow and it's well. been 70 degrees well almost <laughs> you know when you remember when we had that snow it was intense and yeah. it was also on for, the, it's always on the weekends and it went yeah. on for a week and it went on for a while it was you mm. know the the snow on the ground was as bad as it was two years ago for a while do they brine the streets prior to storms what was the process you, you see the trails in the streets they tend to do the hills uh, yeah. in advance to pre-treat it pre -treat. and that's worked out really well yeah. for the ultimate result uh, it's cost effective uh, yeah so with the hundred grand, with the hundred and fifty for the science curriculum, you're still only moving 173k. That's what it looks like. That's yeah. Amazing. Yeah. yeah, and there's um, a small number in street lights. Next year we knock, did knock the budget down a little. Um, there's that two hundred thousand dollar request for the uh, sewer station project. We, we'll ask for it if we don't use it. It'll just go back to reserves. Uh, what's the fifteen k that we're buying? This, we're buying the. What does that pay for? What are you looking at, John? Three oh, the, it was for the um, budget. We just oh, just reducing the budget by fifteen thousand. Yeah. What was? We, uh, sorry. So Colleen mentioned tonight they're changing ballast, they're changing uh, lamps. Yeah. So that's on their their spend, right? Um, no, she showed a pass through savings about fifty. Uh, it doesn't exactly directly correlate to our budget, but it's in the ballpark. We did knock our budget down a couple years ago. Down a couple years ago by about fifty thousand. I don't really know if it's anticipation or actual, but our um, streetlight budget is substantially lower now than it was five, seven years ago. We've knocked 100,000 plus off of it for a variety of reasons. LED was one of them. Um, they also just started a different way of charging. Okay. 
Uh, Article 6, that's a prior year bill for $90.72 that went into the fire chief spam filter. That's right. <laughs> so you can blame him. Uh, here's our surplus uh, declaration, and you can see the Metro Fire is described, <coughs> not on a list, but we that do own good. it. So what's going to happen to that? Where's that going to go? Uh, Milton, actually. They're below Reading on the hand-me-down list. I just love that. <laughs> 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 Having grown up there. Article 8 is uh, OPEB, and in addition to the usual transfer of money, um, Town Council has strongly recommended we adopt this language and change the way we did a trust. We were one of the first communities to create a trust before there was legislation. Now we're just reverting back to accept the legislation to make sure we're all protected. So it's not, it shouldn't be a big thing. That's amazing. That stuff he catches. He's yeah. good. Huh. Uh, Article 9 is, is the famous Oakland Road. I thought we'd take another crack at that. Yep. I tried to explain in the background what last November was because people came up to me for weeks after that and didn't really understand. You can take another shot at that one. Um, Article 15 was to discontinue portions of private ways. Article 16 had two parts to it. One was to declare surplus, and the other was to authorize the selectmen to sell or dispose of the land. Now, Article 15 passed. Article 16 did not pass. There was a move to reconsider 16 to split it in half and effectively right. just do the first part. That also did not pass. I, I think there were a fair number of people who really just not didn't that it understand. Not did not pass. That. They did not get to the point to pass. It didn't, it didn't get reconsidered. Right. So this article does what the first part of Article 16 would have done last November. So It eliminates could, the, the ability could, to sell. Can I ask a favor? Uh, yeah. Next time a motion for reconsideration comes back from council, can we have a look at it before it gets put before a town meeting? Because I think part of the confusion was the wording, that the specific wording he used, which is very different from yeah. the way we do motions. So I think it engendered well, some of the confusion. It was clumsy. My, right? my recollection, correct me if I'm wrong, but was also there wasn't really much of an explanation allowed. Sure, it's debatable. I didn't think there was much of one allowed. No, given there, you know what? Re I don't think there was much of one allowed. Because totally I was debatable. ready to go I up and stand difference. there as was Ray. And, we and tried to explain it, but yeah, yeah. we just weren't allowed. Well, Alan was. A tad on the strict side there. Yeah, I, I and that's even okay. Over the top. Uh, but but I, I just know said. from the feedback afterwards, a number, and I mean by that more than 10 town meeting yeah. members, really did not understand so what the reconsideration issue was. So we'll make a tight presentation mm -hmm. this time. Yeah. Uh, there's a style issue here, which is you could describe uh, Article 16. Sorry. Current Article 9. 9. We could describe this in the way it looks today, or we could describe it in the way it looked last year, or the way you've done here. I wonder if we're better served starting with a clean sheet of paper and keeping this in the back pocket when somebody says, hey, what does this reflect last year? But don't go there to start because you're kind of digging up last year over again and it gives your eyes to you guys looking for a third bite of the apple. I'm sure I agree with that. So you can do it any way you want, but I'd rather describe what it is, not what it isn't. It's a custodial warrant. If you, it's if the, you, it's to put the thing in the care and custody. I agree with yeah. you, but there was kickback the last time. I'm trying to avoid the. You if you, it wrong again. If you, I think if you do that, you're you guaranteed that people that. are going to ask. Wait a minute, what did we do last November? If we don't explain it, people think then we're trying to go. I think it's better to lead with it and get it out okay. of the way. Yeah. I, <laughs> I think that it needs to be clear that the town meeting did not want the. I think the town meeting did not want the selectmen to be able to have the authority to sell right. without coming back correct. to them, and I understand I so. that. Yeah, and I, you know, and I was saying crystal, crystal clear. Well, I, I know you said it, Chris, in a clear way, Barry. Unquestionably, you did. Yes. But it wasn't heard. Right. I mean, yeah. it just wasn't heard, and I'm not sure why. But um, and to be fair, in other years we've been given that, although it's insufficient, we've been told yeah. to do even more. Get rid of it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, the Oakland Raiders wasn't will leave uh, Oakland before Oakland will leave. <laughs> 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 leave Oakland Road with yeah. a toe tag. Right? <laughs> um, Article 10 is to spend more money in the library. And um, I'll just read this sentence. If this article is needed, the town yeah, manager yeah. or his successor will have a lot of explaining. Uh, I, mm. that I, I would I would I expect this to be tabled, but I think it was important that you put it in the warrant. Yeah. Oh, do we, I mean, just real. There is no plan to use this. I should be supportive. I did get a call from Bob LeBrec today that needed to speak with me, but I don't think it's because we don't have enough money. Okay. 
excluded. Uh, last I knew, we had spent maybe at most half of this hundred forty-one thousand. So it's probably good to give an update on that, anyways. Just to at some point, yeah. And, and this could be an article where we just do that. Yeah. Just yeah. give a summary. Just so that people don't like think, oh, the other shoe's going to drop at some point. Yeah, God knows. Let's hope not. I'm not Will aware of that. Done? Shoe. Will the punch list be done by then? They're down to about a hundred, which sounds like a lot of things, but they it's were at like not. three or four thousand um, when the library opened. Mm. So, Amy's really happy, as some of you saw that local yeah, history. The history was, really nice. was done. Yeah. yeah, and the um, I mean, people are thrilled about being able to get to the microfish. And, oh, uh, good. Um, so that's all. You know. Okay, I didn't Even know that was fixed. About the library, can I mention something slightly off topic? I'm still getting calls from the neighbors about the lights being on on holidays. Yeah, there's a meeting with the trustees, I oh, think, good. next Monday. Oh, they taking that over? Yeah. Well, it's their building. <laughs> good. Let's see. Article 11 is uh, $2.4 million for a sewer station work on uh, Charles Street. That's in the capital plan. Um, Article 12 is the same one the Retirement Board put forth uh, last November and then tabled. Sharon described it to the Finance Committee last week. Um, it's a relatively small change. I'm not going to try to explain it to you, but it's, it's a change from $360 a year to $420 a year of a COLA increase for all retirees above 12000 or 14000 But actuarially, it, it adds $1.5 million to our pension liability because it's now and forever in the Never future. Ever. So the reason they tabled it in November is because, you know, there's a bunch of CPAs sitting around and they said, how can this be? <laughs> how could it be 1.5 million? And then they did all say that. They looked at the math and they suddenly realized it really is. It's really 1.5 million. So, you know, whether this and which, is the, who, are the, who are those CPAs in question? Uh, the retirement board, okay. broadly. Um, you just appointed a new member, so. Yep. Um, you know, it, it's the prior retirement board, but and, and actually there's going to be three new members as of uh, town meeting versus last November, which is interesting. Um, you know, and, and they'll have to, you know, present on its merits, uh, whether it's a good or bad idea. Sharon did that again to FinCom last week, and um, FinCom did not sound very supportive, I'll say, not to prejudge them. Uh, you know, adding a million five to a liability at this time is... Not great, and I will say that if you looked at the distribution of retiree pay, if you could direct money towards the lower end, I think most people would support it. Um, you know, there are there are a big portion of our retirees making uh, less than fifteen thousand dollars a year, and no one would begrudge them a hundred dollars or two hundred dollars. I think, but if you're pulling down a fifty or seventy-five thousand dollar pension, and we can't distinguished by law we have to say everyone yeah, or everybody's the same so we'll see how that goes um, we're asking to abolish the sick leave and vacation buyback stabilization fund which has like thirty dollars in it yep. under article 13 you've been preparing for that for a while yeah I thought we spent all the money then it suddenly got interest um, <laughs> article 14 is the annual um, affordable housing trust fund mm -hmm. no change article 15 is the annual uh, revolving fund and since the AG has not yet approved our new bylaw we're pretty much putting the same article out there um, we may tailor it if the AG does approve it by town meeting but it is not necessary I will say that some of the balances in these funds are so low I don't I don't know why we have a town force revolving fund from 2011 that's never been used I think the town force committee needs to talk about that because mm. there was a timber clearing plan that they worked on it's well, it says the balance in the fund is zero. It's never been used. There's never been any money put in or Wasn't taken there, out. Why aren't we supposed to be selling some tim like doing some clearing? Yeah, and, and I, I don't, you know, Jeff Zager has been the liaison. At one point I heard, you know, much like different markets change, um, the secondary market for that was declining. Yeah. But with all the home if you, have, if you create a revolving fund and haven't used it for six years, someone's got to ask the question. Right. So in the next year, I think we'll have to look so at Bob, that. So, Bob, everything that you've just, I mean, you, you've, going through some things pretty this is the stuff that we had in our packet to review yeah. so nothing's yep. new nothing's new no nothing's new today as of what was in your packet uh article 16 is the budget such as it is such article 17 is to accept money from the state for chapter 90 road mm -hmm. grant yeah. money uh, article 18 i still need to write up the background i i've missed a lot of meetings so i'm 
I'm a little slow on that. But it's the Permanent Building Committee. You guys are pretty yep. familiar with yep. them visiting you. Yeah, I see you put the only word in there in paragraph four. Thank you. Which one again? Oh, yeah. The only the three sponsor Yes. Yeah. Uh, let's see. And are we, is the, um, is the work done with the bylaw committee around that? I think they still want to meet, but they think, I think it is. They want to still meet with town council to describe all the, well, some of the bylaws will and the be, zoning will they bylaws. Be have that work out of the way by town meeting? I don't know if it'll be out of the way in time to go to print, but it will be done by town meeting. Ray's been away and he'll be back Friday. I think we just need to stay close to that because yeah. I know that they had a lot to do. Yeah, they have three or four, they have some interest in some of the zoning bylaws, the marijuana ones. They do want to ex at least hear from town council and, right. and they may want to express an opinion. Um, 19 is the accessory apartments, that sort of unintended consequence of the right. yep. apartment up front. Yeah. And I would certainly suggest that we take a position on that uh, given that we were prime movers and shakers on that, even though CPDC sponsors it. Technically. We'll look at something here. Did you ever get back to that guy? What? Dude, what were we supposed to kind of monitor that guy? The, 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 oh, the, 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 the springtime issue. Did you this is put some yeses and noes on that flow chart? Get the spring. Yeah. I tried to. I couldn't figure out how. Oh. Uh, you can do it in paint. Okay. I'll try that. Yeah. i got to change it to Use, what the uh, articles really are. Text boxes are called. Uh, it seemed JPEG. like articles 20, 21, and 22 called for an overview up front to say yeah, what the good. heck's going on here. So, you know, this picture kind of summarizes it. Um, if the yeah. local voters vote yes, and I couldn't figure out how to make a yes yeah, there, then we go to article 20. If town meeting says yes to that, yeah. then we go to 22. If they go to say no on 20, we go to 21 for a moratorium. And if the voters say no, we the go voters to for no, we go to a moratorium. It's really not hard. Right. I think this visual will help some people. Well, it's necessary for the voter is the very simple, do we want recreational and um, commercial? Yeah. I don't know if we need to get into that depth in the FAQ. We're just talking to the voters. I don't think you need to go there. They're going to get confused. If we the voters only need to know about this. I don't think it's to, to the question. Well, the other thing, too, is, I mean, one of the things is what happens if this doesn't pass? Well, we'll say there are other options that town meeting can consider without a lot of detail behind it. I, I think you're going to be very careful of the yeah. what if it doesn't pass thing. Okay. I don't think you can go there actually. I yeah. Mean, I, you look, think I'm, you know, I don't, I don't think it's a very complex they, issue. The, the consequences. I think it's Nova. pretty straightforward actually. We um, can keep it very general, but we need to tell them there's a path. I think that, all you can really say in a no vote is town meeting will be asked if they will pass a moratorium while we yeah. figure out rules, which may or may not pass. See a problem? Yeah. I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to confuse the issue. I think it's pretty straightforward. You either want to have recreational um, or manuf you know, the, you either want the commercial, commercial you know, um, or industrial application of recreational marijuana, or you don't. It really, I think you should talk about the fact that it does not, in, it doesn't have any implication to their personal use. It doesn't have any implication to their personal growing. I think you, that's very fair, but I think you have to be careful of saying, and the, this this chart right here. I, it doesn't help the voter. I don't we're think not, it helps the sure. voter well, actually, at all. People won't see this chart. I'm not talking about the, the chart. I'm yeah. saying, and I'm not worried about the intellect. Verbiage. I'm worried about general confusing general. the issue. Yeah. It's a people, simple issue. Yeah, but I think people need to know that if you know what it means, what a yes vote means, what a no vote. means. The no vote means that, that there's still, re, there's a town meeting recourse. And I, it's just kind of. Well, it's but now, but it's now not, are you giving them a not, yes or no vote yeah, or an either it's or? Not, it's not really a recourse. Yeah, maybe that is. Well, it's a timeout. I think uh, you got to be very careful of that. I don't think this is that right. complex, Barry. I'm going to give that some thought. Yeah, if, if the voters vote no, then we can't prevent it. <laughs> uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying I quite agree, but I see your point, John. Uh, well, yes, it's, it's a straightforward, it's a yes or a no vote. That's clear. That's all they're going to have. Should we or shouldn't we? Yes or no? But we if we're giving them information, we need to kind of give it a little color about mm -hmm. sort of how this comes up and sort of what the what the choices are before the town. And or you say something general like a no vote will leave the uh, the issue open to the vagaries of the state or something. Like that. I, I think a no vote leaves us open to have it. It's just a question of when. Only yeah. the voters yeah. can prevent it. Right. If they vote no, then we get it. I like that. 
And I think that's the key component right there, which is yeah. exactly what you just said, Bob. I think that's what people will get. And it comes back to what John was saying. You either want it or you don't. No, you can't. I'm confused. You guys talking about the vote on April 4th, or are you talking about yeah. the town meeting on April 4th? No, the, the, voter. The, the, the election. Right. Yeah, we'll have to kick this around. Yeah, I, yeah, we'll just. I, I do hear his point, but I don't want to not say anything. Yeah. We'll find it. We'll find a middle ground there. Article 23 changes from uh, 20 to 25 percent the affordable um, for rental. And again, this would allow the town to count all rental units, not just the affordable ones in the 40 so R district. Owned are 20. Owned would stay as 20. Uh, rental, rental would change from 20 to, to 25. Will that change existing? Nope. Yep. It's okay. not retroactive. Nope. Right. It would give us a framework to have that discussion with anyone if the economics were right, but no, it doesn't reach back. Um, and also, <coughs> it, importantly, there's an exemption <coughs> if you have a, a small project, 12 units or smaller. Oh, so if it's 12 units or smaller, then, it, then it's not... Um, it doesn't apply. It's only for more than 12 units. Right, which so 12 or smaller, it doesn't I apply. I didn't listen. I listened to one of their meetings. Yeah. So if somebody is down on South Main, or not on South Main, but in between Haven and Washington on Main Street and wants yeah. to develop Four a parcel or, or two, yeah. and they want to put half a dozen units on top of it, yep. they're not going to be, they're yeah. not going to be charged with an, with an affordable unit. That's what that All right, I guess. And it's up to the moderator, and um, we discussed it internally, I don't know if he's going to allow an amendment to the 12 to be a smaller number, because that, I'm not sure that's within the four corners. You can make it a bigger number and make it less onerous, but to make it more onerous, I'm not think, sure. Yeah, I don't just, think you can. can just you? to throw that out there. Why don't we just put a, we should have had at least a minimum, you know, number. I mean, if you're going to do, you know, well, it's 12. Of one. Well, 13. No, but I mean, if you're going to do like 10 units, you know, to have a minimum of. Well, the 13 would be 25% of 13. No, but just to do, or, or, or so it's, it, it's exempt under 12, but then you have sort of a, you know, um, it's not 20, it's, it's, a, it's one. You know, have why, two why, do give, why do we give the why do we give you know lose the ability to create an affordable unit if it's a smaller product? Granted, it might only be one or two, but it's still for the two. simple reason that affordability-wise, for the developer, they're going to have a problem making that decision, making the thing pencil out. Yeah, yeah I don't I mean, know how why. DPDC arrived at twelve. I'm sure there was some discussion. I think it's arithmetic. Yeah, I had heard. Property owners want, you know, having interest in doing four units or six units. I don't know what I missed to get them to 12. I'm sure there was yeah. discussion though. Uh, and lastly, I, I think, well, aside from town meeting members, is the uh, making the smart growth district bigger and putting it to the, you know, all of business B as shown in this map. So currently it's this dotted section right here. Yep. And this is just to enhance it, increase it to the other side of Main Street. And that's that's one we should weigh in on, in my opinion. And the last article so is uh, town meeting members that did not attend uh, half the sessions. So it's kind of a big <coughs> list, but if you remember, we had shocked three town. I'm shocked at some of the names. Well, we had three town meetings going at one time, so yeah. that counted three times against them if they oh, weren't there. Oh, uh, that's true. So. That's not fair. All right, well, it is what it is. Okay. So there you go. I'm sure they'll be rescued by their uh, respective uh, cockeye. <laughs> or if they show up. <laughs> if, they show up. <laughs> if they're there. <laughs> I think they'll be there. So Paul has listed all the articles I just covered from four to the end. They tend um, to yeah. board can do what it wishes. They tend to show yeah. up for that one for the April um, one. Yeah. The only the only two I would see us not supporting are ten, the library and twenty five, the removal of the members. Anybody have any other thoughts? How about the uh, retirement board? Oh, uh, yeah, I've got questions on that too. Why would we not do the li the library? Well, I'm not proposing I'm not anything. I'm not proposing so any money for it. Yeah. There's, oh, no, right. there's no money recommended. So I, I'm going to say to FinCom you shouldn't support it because I'm not, well, we can recommend we're not it asking for anything. It's not an article yet. If, if, say, if it turns into an article, I, again, I'll have a lot of explaining to right. do, and I will. Right. But we can just, just not even take a position on that. That might be a better way. Yeah. Yeah. And then just, yeah. So we would eliminate. I would eliminate the retirement board, too, because I'm not comfortable. If, if FinCom's not comfortable, I'm not. So that's 12. 10 yeah. is library. Well, isn't town meeting want us to take a position no. on these things? It's up to you. 
Totally up to you. No, I mean, I'll, I'll well, I mean, do we? I mean, with some of those retirees who are making twelve, fifteen thousand dollars a year. I mean, the times are tough, Barry. I, I I don't mean to speak for FinCom. Yeah, that's just Sharon's words saying. That's okay. You know, she talked to a couple of members at the end of the meeting. Or I mean, not, I, I not disposed to supporting it this year. What was the other um, article to pull? Uh, Twenty-five. 25. Twenty-five is formulaic, right? It's there yeah. every year. Well, yeah. Yeah. We yeah. You shouldn't take a position on that. That's we town. No, it's not our business. Right. That's the business. Oh, that's all the. Oh, the uh, it's up yeah. to the individual precincts. It's the precincts and the town meeting. That's really well, not our business. Decide. No dog in that fight. So, so ten, twelve, and twenty-five. Right. You can move all the rest if you want. We all all set with discussion. Uh, yeah. Is there do any does anybody need to talk about any of these articles? No. Other than the ones we talked about, do we want to weigh in on the on the on the 40 hour? I mean, do we want to have a position on that? I think you are by default. You are by not eliminating them. Oh, okay. Yeah, for sure. Right. So would anybody mind if I just read this motion and just say move all of the except, recommended subject matter with the exception absolutely. of 25, 10, 10, 10 and, 12. and 12. Although the budget's in here, do we are we moving the budget? Um, have we done the past? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. We have part of that. And we're part of the solution to the school committee, I guess, with the uh, Well, we, you know, we always forward. sit as an, an advisor to Bob, and it's Bob's budget. Right. Yeah, it's I think mine, it's an endorsement of Bob's work. Another couple weeks. Another couple weeks. Yeah. weeks. Okay. Although the FinCom will be wanted to talk, we will to talk, present it, right? Yeah. Okay. Motion on the floor, I will second. Any further discussion? So this takes out 10, 12, and 25? Yes. I got that right? Right. Fourth through 24. Otherwise, are okay. Yes. All those in favor? Hey, I'll leave you with a very quick overview of something for the future. <clears throat> um, this was only in your today's packet. I didn't want to scare you over the weekend. Um, this is a list of all the boards and committees I could find in Reading. I'm sure I'd oh. probably miss some. Is that in tonight? Uh, it's, it's in tonight's handout. I well, there you go. And if you start at page I'm sorry. Um, 10, 10 and 11 give you background of where the boards get their authority. I thought that'd be helpful. And I, I broke them into four groups. Um, elected boards and committees, that's pretty easy, independent of the selectmen. You have the library trustees, selectmen, moderator, commissioners, our military commissioners, and the school committee. What's Those OML, are easy. Uh, Open OML. meeting law. Oh. Um, and then you have another group of what I would call um, generally independent of the board of selectors. I mean, you do appoint some members to the audit committee, but they're really very independent of, of you. So I have audit committee, board of registrars, bylaw committee, celebration committee, which is a, created by town meeting. Charter Review Committee, which will be created by town meeting, uh, Cultural Council, Finance Committee, Mystic Valley Elder Services, Permanent Building Committee, our CASA, and RCTV. So I describe those as generally independent of you. And then um, there's really, the rest have more involvement and more oversight by the selectmen. There's a small group that's only partially appointed by you. <clears throat> Even though you may appoint members in that other group, you really don't have direct oversight. Rec Committee. Um, you know, you, you have eight out of nine seats, so it's pretty close, but the school committee has one. Uh, housing authority have four out of five, the state has one. Retirement board, as you've just done, um, you appointed one member. Our multi citizen advisory board, you have one member. And then the Veterans Memorial Trust Fund um, is, a, is a creation of town meeting. You appoint the custodian of soldiers, sailors' graves to that one. So about one out of three. The rest of them are all fully yours. So I, I just wanted to give you that overview. <clears throat> Is this to remind us that if we spread these out, <laughs> um, we each have six, they each meet, which means that generally speaking, um, if we can complete our liaison work, We'll be working probably about three nights a week, at least. Always. Well, without you, any new meetings, special meetings, 
Yeah, but that doesn't mean you have to watch the meetings live. You can monitor minutes, you can watch. No, I understand that, yeah. but you know, I mean, let's just be real. I mean, it's a lot of ground to cover. It is, it a, lot it is a lot of ground. So it's a, uh, it's a lot yeah. of ground to cover. Yep. Yeah. And it is. It's not as though you can, you know, sit at home and watch most of these because you can't. Right. No, well, we can't. You know, most actually, you know, there's very few that you can watch. They're not televised. Though. And and I know this will be negotiations, but it's food for thought for you to think about. What do you want RCTV or their successor to cover in the future? You know, we can only negotiate that every so often. So many years ago, there was a very small list of must. I can't remember. School committee, FinCom, CPDC, Board of Selectmen. Well, at this moment, we don't have all elected boards no. being being filled, right? Which is almost unthinkable to me. But so, uh, just to remind you that you know that's a lot of ground for them to cover too. But it's part of yeah. the negotiation. Can we require that uh, they record any meeting being held in a uh, wired type room like this? I think so. Is that unreasonable? We don't know what the remote. I don't know. Well, you guys are going to be negotiating that. They got one guy for the two rooms here. How do they work? The they program? they have the. My understanding is they have the technology to record when they're not physically present yeah. here. So, I don't think it matters. They should be able to do both. They've said that they will, but I don't know if they do. Mm -hmm. They whether they can both be live. I don't know. Well, we'll have to talk to them. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean they do it with volunteers, right? So uh, no. They're paid. They're paid. They're paid. Yes, sir. Um, so that's an overview, and the reason I gave it, and this is absolutely a future discussion, but I just wanted to bring it up. Um, my idea was to start creating projects that more than one committee would look at so they'd actually get to know their neighbor. Um, the first one, and I'll show you some, some more slides, the old water treatment plant has sat vacant for quite some time. It's a resource of the town. I think it's time to do some sort of master plan for that site by a group of people. Have we demolished um, it? Or is it just, say again? Is it still, did we demolish it? The treatment plant's gone, plant, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So it's just the yeah. land that's there. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm, for instance, suggesting this is a project to be led by the conservation agent. I haven't told him yet. And then the DPW uh, director would appoint someone. And just as an example, Climate Advisory Committee, CONSCOM, mm -hmm. uh, Town Forest, Trails would be mandatory, and I think you should invite the recreation, recreation Committee. Those are my thoughts. Yeah. I just want to show you a quick... And the more of that cross-roughing that happens, the better result. I think so. Is that I, an autonomous group in your mind? Once it's um, ad hoc yeah. group, maybe? You know, we'll discuss format. Do you want to create an ad hoc and pick people from that? Do you want to have those whole bodies go in on it? I don't know. My Let's keep in mind. Yeah. There, there has to right. be yeah. more communication, but you don't want a massive group that can't right. get anything done. You can't turn this into 50 or 60. Right. Because right. we're already at 36. Right. right. Now, these are boards working together, yeah. is my idea. Now that they're working together, do you want them to work autonomously? How do they report out? How do they I think them? we need to decide that. You know, these, these are all your appointees, just to be clear, right. in this case. Um, some others, not so much. It seems like you want them to be advisory. In the past, you've created ad hoc committees, not to create a new committee, but. We just, I mean, I, if we do something on an ad hoc basis, that's fine. The idea of chartering new committees yeah. and off sunset dates and all that, I mean, no, just, no. we can't I, do it. I'm just talking about a big project. You want the group to be completely autonomous, or do you want them to out the mile for anything? Then you've got to throw in the building committee if you, on something like that, Maybe. too. Not necessarily. Unless you're going to propose to put a building on it. That's what you have a mess to They're studying process. all the town owned land, so right. they've got this on their radar. Yeah. And just to show you, there's a lot of wetlands down there. That's really all mm -hmm. I wanted to show. Yeah, and you know, who knows? We might find somebody, somebody may have an interest in some commercial development back there that has a certain kind of use that's going to fit. Yeah. <coughs> just to quickly go through a couple others. <clears throat> now, this is something Nelson Burbank told me almost 10 years ago, and it took me a while to get around to it. Um, and that's to put together a group to talk about community resources and community events. Um, <clears throat> we don't really do this in a centralized way. And, you know, I'll compare ourselves to Wakefield. I, I have a great deal of admiration the way Wakefield does a lot of things. Um, they have 
probably a similar amount of volunteers as us, maybe not quite so many, but their volunteers create things and do them, yeah. and they invite the town to attend, hmm. as opposed to they come to the town and say, can you do this, and we yeah. might come and help you. Um, Wakefield does not have the bandwidth any more than Reading does for some of this, so the residents go out and do it themselves. They form a nonprofit. Um, you know, their their July uh, or their uh, parade is they all do nonprofit. They do Italian American night. They do a number of events completely on their own. And you know, there's good and bad for any approach. But the point is, I think Reading should sit down and talk about community events. You know, we we talked about the Fall Street Fair. <laughs> there's three events that we do now. Um, this is an economic development tool to some degree. Um, you know, let's talk about it as a, as a group. And I think the rec administrator is the right one to lead this. Uh, I have Board of Health because it would involve that. I have the uh, elected boards invited to this one because it seems like a broad community thing. Uh, Council on Aging, Fall Street Fair Committee, uh, Human Relations Advisory Committee, and um, RCTV and the Recreation Committee seem to all make sense. So those were two relatively simple things, relatively, that I think could start immediately. I have some other things down the road. Um, Nelson also asked me that years ago to get some organized charitable giving instrument, and maybe this is more important, we move it up. Um, you know, what he said to me was, there's a lot of people in this town that would donate if they knew what they were getting giving for I think he's right about that and I, I, I know that he's right about that because I've had that conversation with a number of people over the years you're not asking me so I'm not giving you know you guys a bunch of you sat on the trust fund commissioners you know the resources we have you know the veterans memorial trust fund that started I don't know 10 years ago and I do see occasionally they advertise it and they fundraise for it but it's not big time fundraising yeah. Um, there's also a limit to what they spend it on. So. Absolutely, but and that's would, the question. They would ask for more probably if they had a project that they would want. They could to pay do. for the veterans agent. Just saying. So I think that, again, a wide swath of these groups, um, this is a more financially oriented Board of Cemetery Trustees, and I won't go through the list. Um, historical document preservation, I think at some point is very important for this town. Yep. Uh, a lot of you know what's in this building, what's in the library. Yeah. It's it's about time we organize that, and the town clerk should and the library People should be involved in that. For, for that. I yep. think you're absolutely right, Barry. It's fifteen thousand in the budget for this next year, but it's a holdback for the school budget. Uh, fifteen thousand doesn't go very far, but she. No, but Laura you've got can, climate issues. You've well, got Laura can come issues. in sometime and show you what she did for fifteen thousand last year. It's really remarkable. Some of the yeah. documents that were restored. Um, from hundreds of years ago to current condition. Yeah. So it's kind of embarrassing that we don't do a particularly good job on this. It's really yeah, one of the coolest books I've ever seen is this uh, At Wood End. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, Wood End is a great book. I, I go back to because there's a ton of work put into writing that and laying it out. I could imagine these historical documents might be a, kind of a, an appendix to that. Well, and we have, have a. Have you ever, have you ever roamed downstairs? I have. I mean, I, I oh. even want to. <coughs> you you're you afraid yeah, of touching some of these dust. things. They're 400 years old, right? You break it, you bought it. Yeah. <laughs> But it's stunning that it's sitting oh, downstairs. Um, I, you, could, you could product that. You could turn that into <clears> something <throat> people would buy. Another kind of a compendium of the history of Reading from the original documents. I mean, we have you know, very interested and active two historical commissions, if you will, at this point with the Historic District Commission. One would think this is a project that they would enjoy. Yeah. And I think a lot of people in this town would enjoy participating. Especially coming up to our 375th. Yeah. With the celebration committee. Yeah. And and last but not least, Andrew and I have chatted about this. We're not sure what the right timing is. He'd rather do it yesterday. Some kind of economic development planning that would involve a lot of boards and committees. That's a much bigger project. That's a much bigger well, thing. Well he's to making his rounds. Around. Yeah, I know. He is hurting cats. Um, yeah. But he's doing a good he's doing a really good job of he making is. the rounds. Yeah. Um, yeah, and he wasn't kidding about that lunch he set up because I that, had heard funny. about that. Um, this one is is a big project. This is essentially what you've sort of discussed for the last year or two of having a summit. Right. I think this is really the focal point of such a summit. Absolutely. It doesn't involve every board or committee, but it doesn't it does <coughs> touch many of them. We we have to act on this. It gives you a focus. So I just wanted to throw that out there now. Um, we kick it around a little bit more as to first of all what's the most important priorities. We don't want to do them all. There's no way that's going to work. 
pick one or two, we can get started. Right, because I mean, these boards still have their regular work to right. do. Right. And you want to discuss each of each of these or any other idea can have different formats from each other. Doesn't all have to be the same thing, but you want to discuss that. What's the most effective way? Uh, my idea was not to create any new boards or committees. There's, there's plenty. Um, and I don't know what the appetite for some of these members are. Some, some of them have a hard time having joint meetings because they meet on a Monday or on a Wednesday. And if you don't meet on a Monday, I can't go. If you don't meet on a Wednesday, I can't go. So, you know, there might be some logistical issues. But especially in Gene's department, we've done a really good job in the last three or four years of putting staff together to talk to each other. Now, first of all, they're full time, mostly. Yeah. Um, they have the time to talk to each other. They, they understand what's going on in every sector, more or less. Not perfectly. Uh, the boards don't have that opportunity. Yeah. You guys know when you've sat with other boards how productive it generally is. Yeah. Um, they need the same thing. You know, boards that peripherally touch each other. I don't know. Just pick any two. You a could of, probably a name. Of our, a lot of our boards are silent. And, yeah. And, and and not not because they don't want to. It's just that people are drawn to them because they have yeah. a certain interest or a certain expertise. And they're passionate about it, and they do it, and they serve well. It takes someone outside of that silo to kind of bring them together, and I think it would work just as well. Well, I can tell you the solution, and I can tell you the chances of you implementing it are not high. Um, insist on a rotation program among volunteers. Don't let them just go to one thing and stay there. You start here, you, then you go here, then you go there. Well, I've asked other mayors and managers, and they all think that's crazy, but. If you want them to see a broader picture of the town, that's how you get it. Although, you know, just being on the Basque this year, how many new people have come to oh, yeah. join on things that, you know, they raise their hand and they're in? You know, some of you, two of you, three of you. Um, you know, being on FinCom gives you a broad picture and helps you step into another role. There's not a lot of boards and committees that are like that, that have a broad picture of the whole town in right. any way. Right. You know, they have it for conservation, they have it for historic, but they don't have all the pieces. And you're right, it's not their fault. I mean, you're not going to be on CPTC and then, like, the, the, you know, the trail's going to be. But these groups would create right. that, that right. vantage point. They, they, that, that that's a non sequitur. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you just got to get people in the same room for some common purpose. You're going to have to argue about something and not agree for a while. I, yeah, I think they would. I think we have to bring the project to them. In other words, you just can't say, okay, guys, what do you want to do? And then you'll have 80 people well, with That's why, ideas. you know, Strout is, that's a project. Right. Here's an area, figure it out. That's tangible. That one's easy. The others I'd have to work a little bit on. You need a desired outcome, and you need to describe all the focused means that they can use at their disposal. Yeah. Well, not even necessarily an outcome, just say, here's a, here's a problem set. Well, you know, the timeliness of this is really important because what it does is it, I mean, we're ready to reorganize soon. Yep. And, you know, typically coming along with that is, you know, moving around the liaison responsibilities and, you know, a fresh set of eyes in some cases, experience in others. But it all ties into this thing that you're building here about this matrix. Yeah, and, and you know, some of these groups will work out, some of them won't. Uh, you learn from both, and you try it again, whatever it is. Is, um, we're coming up on 375 years, right? It feels that way. <laughs> well, we it wasn't all done tonight. <laughs> we are. Yeah, Alan is, I guess, leading that effort, Alan Foles, yeah. but I haven't heard from him since I think it was last annual town meeting he might have given up. Maybe it was a year ago, November, actually. I don't remember when. Well, that could be. Mm. That, that could be a focal point. I yeah. mean, you could have. Well, that could be this community events focal point. Oh, yeah. Where I was going with this, though, is um, I belong to a church in Wakefield that was the first parish, and they're doing their 375. And I know all of the derivatives are doing as well. North Reading's doing the mm. same thing. Is there a, a really big idea between all the towns? No, that's interesting. No. Between sense. all of Old Reading. Yeah, we feel North <laughs> that's an to which it is. <laughs> I mean, that's yeah. Reading. Yeah. Welcome to 1644 again, right? I also want to pass this around. Speaking of old Reading, that is old a very cool item here. Oh, some yeah, of you yeah, have seen this, some of you haven't. Yeah. 
It's the it's, coolest thing. It's attempted to be produced in your handout yes. tonight, page 13. Yep. Yep. Got the idea. Handle with care. It's really cool to even see that the color still exists. And for the audience, I'll read um, a letter from Post Office Box 5859 <laughs> in San Diego, California. Uh, addressed to me. <clears throat> Dear sir, on Sunday, June 6, 1954, a parade formed oh, near cool. Chute Street, then marched along Haven Street to Main Street to Pleasant Street to where Pleasant Street intersects Eaton Street. That was followed by the dedication of a Little League baseball field freshly built in the Hunt Memorial Park. Although I don't know how they got it, my family has a hard copy of the souvenir program for that event for many years. It's in good condition and I thought Reading might like it. The adults involved here have long gone, of course, but some of the players aged 8 to 12 might still remember the dedication and might like to see what they looked like as children. I include the program. Bill Brown? Uh, Jim Varnador. Oh, no, that's not. <laughs> Bill Brown would so, precede this. First yeah. of all, this is one of the most interesting documents I've ever seen. And for this fellow to take his time instead of just tossing it and writing it to us, I thought it was great. Um, and I'd like to reply something to him. I thought it would be really interesting if, as a community project, we tried to find the people in these pictures. You know, it'll take some advertising, it'll take mm. some information, but boy, if you know. could find 20 people that still live in the area and take a picture of them, it would be great. I actually think you'd probably find a number of them quickly on the I Grew Up in Reading site. Okay. I mean, my like, parents were married on this day. Wow. Really? Wow. Yeah. Well, make them put the old uniforms back on, pose for them. Die. <laughs> 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 have you seen this yet, John? I have. I probably probably really out I, this thing is <laughs> stunning. Oh, what's most amazing is none of the companies are around anymore. The list of business is sponsoring yeah. companies. Yeah. It's, a, it's a really interesting The document. photograph of Hunt Field is great. Wow, there's no trees. No. All the yeah. trees grew after. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but happened. the shack is there. Yeah. yeah. We'll try to get a good copy. I did it quick for your packet. A better copy will put it online. Well, they will. Um, and we'll try to publicize somebody it. They had real dugouts. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> what happened to them? Huh? <laughs> Let's go the scoreboards out there. Okay. Uh, so while that, we're, that's while all we're having this viewing <laughs> fun here, yeah. let's do the minutes, huh? I can read Are you it done with that? I am. Yeah, also, no, no. thanks. Uh, I can do it if you're... Okay. I will do the minutes for you. Okay, okay please do it. Move that the Board of Selectmen approve the minutes of February 21st, 2017 as amended. Um, second. We got a second. All right, second. discussion. No, good job. All in favor? Okay. Um, I think it's now time to entertain a motion to adjourn. Ooh, so moved. <laughs> Do I hear a second? Second. Discussion? All in favor? Here. Live ball. 10.35. Night ball. Night ball. Good night. 10.30.